Thank you so much for attending uh, the U.S. Club Soccer Forum for U.S. Soccer President. My name is Phil Wright. I'm the chairman of the board of U.S. Club Soccer. And I uh, just want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to spend a few hours with us so that we can get to know you better in order for us to determine um, who we are going to support in this uh, election. So, uh, sorry I can't be there. I told the rest of the board I'm having an MRI today, unfortunately, otherwise I would be there. So I will turn this over to our moderator, our CEO, Kevin Payne, and look forward to uh, the dialogue for the rest of the morning. Thank you, Phil. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to go through some housekeeping matters first uh, before we actually kick this off. First, I want to um, welcome and thank uh, our participants today. Um, among the candidates, we have here in the room in Chicago, we have Paul Caligiuri, <clears throat> we have Kyle Martino, we have Michael Winograd, and we have Eric Winalda, and on the telephone we have Steve Gams. Uh, our board members from U.S. Soccer that are here include Mike Colina, <clears throat> who represents the Eastern Region, Mike Sweeney, who represents the Midwest, Sean Blakeman, who represents the West, um, Gary Butte, who represents the Southeast, John Rennie, who represents the Southeast, uh, Casey Crabb, uh, who represents uh, the Southwest. Um, and on the phone, we have Phil Wright, our chairman. We have Jason Dewhurst from the Northeast. We have Tim Leziak from the Midwest. We also have uh, Eddie Henderson from uh, Washington State and the Northwest. <clears throat> and we hope to be joined at some point by uh, Shannon Sarofsky, who uh, represents the East. So we have, uh, right now, we have nine of our uh, board members on, and, and we hope that Shannon will be joining us, or I'm sorry, eight of our board members on. <clears throat> uh, we also will be joined at some point by Christian Lavers, uh, who is a senior member of our staff and, uh, and also involved with ECNL. Um, I want to explain um, the purpose of this forum first, because it's a little different than uh, some of the other forums that, that have been held. For instance, the, the Got Soccer Forum. Uh, this forum really is being held principally to allow our board of directors to talk to the candidates uh, and learn what the candidates stand for, what the issues of concern to them are, and, uh, and better inform us so that we can cast uh, our vote at the election. We, unlike some of the others that have hosted uh, forums, we actually are a voting member. Uh, we will have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 votes at the convention. That's a little bit less than 4% of the total. Um, we vote in both the, the Youth Council and the Adult Council. Um, so there are some things that will be handled a little differently here than perhaps in some of the other forums that have or will take place. <clears throat> I'd also like to explain why and, and who was invited today. Um, our board talked about this some time ago when we first decided to, um, to try to hold a forum, and we decided that we would invite those uh, candidates who had reached out directly to U.S. club soccer. And our reasoning was, uh, and it was not only a selfish reasoning, but our, our reasoning was that if a candidate didn't know enough about the landscape of the soccer um, uh, uh, youth uh, landscape in this country that it didn't recognize the importance of U.S. club soccer, then we didn't think that that candidate was somebody that we could support for president of uh, the federation. So we, we began from that premise. Now, over time, we've been contacted by uh, virtually every, every candidate. Um, and we appreciate those of you who could come here, and we appreciate Steve being on the phone. Um, Carlos Cordero was not able to join us uh, because he is on a, uh, an airplane at this time, but um, he sent his regrets, and we may have an opportunity to speak to him at a later date. Uh, I also want to make clear that for those of you, and the candidates may know this, but we had previously written a letter of nomination to the Federation, which we withdrew yesterday. Um, <clears throat> nobody should read more into the withdrawal other than the fact that we wanted this to be an open process. <clears throat> and we are trying to make up our mind um, about what we want to do with our votes. <clears throat> um, 
So that that nomination was withdrawn um, yesterday, the, which was the deadline, and we may or may not end up making a nomination in the interim period between now and December 12th. Um, we may just decide to cast our vote. We may decide to nominate someone. <clears throat> that will be uh, something that we'll be discussing over the next couple of weeks. The ground rules for today are pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Each candidate will, I think, will just start off in alphabetical order. Each candidate will have an opportunity, uh, a five-minute opportunity, to talk about their platform, why they're running, what are the issues that are important to them. <clears throat> um, when we begin the uh, questions, the first question will be asked by Mike Sweeney, um, <clears throat> And that question will be posed to each of the candidates. Generally speaking, uh, when the candidates are asked a question, um, they will have three minutes to answer. If a, candidate, if a question is asked of a specific candidate and the others want to also comment on it, they'll be given two minutes to add their comments. Uh, and then at the conclusion, we will also afford a four-minute summary opportunity to each of the candidates. So. Um, we expect that this forum will last about four hours. Uh, we're not limited to that. If it's a great conversation and people want to continue, we can do so. Um, we will, this whole conversation will be recorded. Uh, it's being recorded professionally, and it will be on our website uh, some point this evening. Uh, and it will remain on our website, so people can reach out to it and uh, listen to it on demand. Um, does everybody understand the ground rules? They, they're pretty straightforward, I hope. Um, if so, then I think we might as well get going, and I'm going to call on Mike Sweeney first to ask the, the first question. Introduction. I'm sorry? Introduction. Introduction. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, the candidates have an opportunity to, to first to, to introduce, <laughs> to introduce <laughs> themselves and... and, uh, and uh, summarize their platform. So we'll begin with Paul Calgary. <clears throat> well, thank you. And I appreciate uh, U.S. Club Soccer's invitation to come here and speak to uh, a group that has done great things for not only youth soccer, but coaches and clubs across the country. Um, my objective is to align U.S. Soccer with its members. I believe that it's been just the opposite for too long where U.S. Soccer is having their agenda moved into the members versus aligning themselves with the members' objectives. Um, my approach is, as president, I work closely with the board of directors and U.S. Soccer on a different path. I believe it will be a path that will allow us to win more. It will be a culture. We develop a high-performance culture by setting clear expectations, defining better pathways, forward for players and coaches and will create a trusting environment and encourage player growth and development from every aspect. We will operate on a set of values that reflect Americans' commitment to work hard, to innovate, and establish a winning attitude. We will build the organization from the bottom up and make America proud. With that said, I have four major categories that I've looked at in terms of youth development player ID being number two, adult inclusion, number three, and most importantly, diversity. And each one of these um, areas will have integrated with, of course, coaches, because none of those are possible without coaches, and of course with referees. Um, in, in the achievement to um, successfully work towards the strategic pillars of each of these areas, I believe we need to identify what the facts are in those areas and then of course form task force steering committees in each of the areas with the experts of soccer to lead us in those directions and I believe that I'm the, a person that has relationships out there that knows what, how to navigate in the variety of forms that I've been from not just playing professional soccer at the highest level, coaching men's and women's college soccer um, becoming part of Olympic developmental programs, the selection of Adidas ESP programs, starting club soccer, um, working as a director in the, the 
development on academy and really being out there in the in the field of work since my retirement to understand these needs and build these relationships that are so important to build these committees and task force that are meaningful to lead this country in the right direction. In the four major areas, um, when I look at youth development, um, the facts are youth soccer development in the United States is currently fragmented. And as a result, it's limited to the scope of the United States Soccer Developmental Academy. And when I say that, the number one objective I have there is to reform United States Soccer Developmental Academy. And my main initiative is to place the program under the Olympic Developmental Program, specifically under the ID2 program and with the ODP program with USYSA. I believe that those two groups could work meaningful to focus on the elite 5%, 10% of players that we have versus saturating the market with the growth of club soccer where it's become recruiting and a higher method of paying costs for players to play. Those players deserve a better pathway at the highest levels, but certainly we could be more inclusive in the other areas as well. And we can lead this platform versus the opposite method. I don't believe the United States Soccer Developmental Academy should be promoting the recruitment of players from clubs and nor the higher cost of playing for soccer. I do believe under the Olympic Developmental Program over the past 10 years um, prior to the Olympic prior to the USDA, it's worked. For instance, our men's national team participated and qualified for six previous World Cups, and they had a, a strong performance in 1994 World Cup, and they also participated in the 2008 Beijing Olympics where they did quite well. Those, those previous 10 years um, before the United States Development Academy were successful under that platform. In the next 10 years, we saw just, of course, alienating girls, and it wasn't inclusive. Um, but we haven't seen that success. Not only with the most recent not qualifying for the 2018 World Cup, let's not forget we didn't qualify for the 2012 Olympics nor the 2016 Olympics on the men's side. The difference we saw... 30 seconds. The difference we saw on the women's side and the girls' side is they won two gold medals and they're the defending World Cup champs and they did not have any United States developmental platform. I believe the Olympic developmental platform is successful and it is meaningful and it's proven successful over the years and it certainly shows what the success of the women's had and the girls had in the past 10 years of not having the United States Developmental Soccer Academy. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Uh, the next candidate will be Steve Gans, who's on the phone. Steve? Thanks, Kevin, and thanks, everyone uh, at U.S. Club Soccer for hosting this. Um, I just want to be clear off the bat, uh, the fact that I'm not there, I'm really sorry that I can't be there, uh, and please don't take it as a lack of respect. My older son, Noah, um, has had a dream freshman playing year at Brandeis, and he's helped lead them to the D3 Final Four um, this weekend, and we're shortly going to take off as a family to... Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina for that. So it's a very short work week here in Boston. So again, my apologies for not being there in person. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about my platform. I've been steeped in our sport my whole life. My dad came from Germany and passed his passion for soccer down to me as I have to my two sons. At age 15, I wrote to then NASL Commissioner Phil Woosnam about why the Boston team was failing and he sent a senior league executive in from New York to meet with me and hear my thoughts. At 16, I began writing for Soccer America magazine. At 17, I went away to play soccer at and attend Cornell University, but I transferred back home to Brandeis so I could keep a part-time job with the New England team and the Boston NASL team at that time. After a college career filled with injuries, I deferred law school so I could chase a playing in front office dream in pro soccer in America. And I joined the Baltimore Blast, the original Baltimore Blast of the MISL, and, and reached those dreams. And, and as you know, that club is one of the most successful 
teams in the history of pro soccer in America. At age 29, I was tasked with turning around Boston's bid effort to become a host playing site for World Cup 94, which was ranked at that time 29th and last of all American cities in terms of its bid effort, hoping to be a host site. It took three years of hard work, but along with a great team, we successfully secured Boston as a playing site for World Cup 94. Since that time, I have continuously been working on matters in the sport, from youth soccer to the pros to the Premier League, as an attorney, business advisor, and consultant. I've been a board member of a development academy club, been a parent of DA players. I understand and relate to every, every constituency in U.S. soccer because I am of and from every constituency. I fully respect those who have felt compelled to run for president after the men's national team recently failed to qualify for next year's World Cup, but I've long pointed out that there are critical issues in U.S. soccer which have to be addressed, and I announced my presumptive, presumptive candidacy way back in May. The U.S. loss last month was not a moment frozen in time, but rather a manifestation of the systemic problems in U.S. soccer that I've been talking about for some time. I went on a listening tour to meet the delegates following my May announcement and was told that delegates want more respect, better leadership, more fairness and reform in U.S. soccer. I'm the person to provide that and to improve the experience and results of U.S. soccer. This job, the president's job, is a huge one and requires someone with deep soccer experience, significant organizational leadership experience, consensus building skills, conflict resolution skills, business experience, negotiation skills, and one who has demonstrated superb judgment and leadership abilities throughout his or her career. I believe that I'm the only candidate who combines a deep and continuous soccer background with a deep business and organizational leadership background. It is time for change. We hear that at high calls and high levels. People have asked me to run for president for a few years now because there are important democratic principles at stake and because we, in fact, can do better. I will briefly touch on a few points on the platform in the interest of time, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it in the actual event. As president, I will be responsive to all constituencies, yet improve the fortunes of the men's national team and keep the women's national team on top while improving their working condition immediately. As president, you will get someone to whom ethics is the highest principle. U.S. soccer will be run with transparency and accountability. As someone with no obligating ties to FIFA, I will be a true FIFA reformer. We'll hold a soccer summit in the first 60 days of my administration which will include representatives from the entire U.S. soccer community so that all voices are heard and respected. I will ensure that U.S. soccer employees in Chicago will be responsive to and respectful of all council members. I will create and participate in task force of youth state associations and national affiliates to address and solve the counterproductive competition amongst sanctioning organizations, which occurs beneath the top line of U.S. soccer registration numbers currently. Part of the large surplus will be used to support additional programming at the youth and adult levels to provide scholarships for youth players who cannot uh, not otherwise afford to play and to increase coaching education. The Athletes Council will play a critical leadership role regarding strategy for the youth and adult national teams and every player who puts on a jersey, no matter what team or what level, age level, will be shown proper attention and respect if they're representing our country. I will encourage all interested parties to meet and design a system that will be similar to the training compensation and solidarity payment system used throughout the world. I will give a voice back to the youth council and the adult council in matters that impact their ability to administer effective programming and services to their membership. A soccer nation cannot be great and fully successful if it does not have a robust professional league and professional landscape. 30 seconds, I will throw great support. I will throw great support behind each of our professional soccer leagues. The U.S. Development Academy will be substantially revamped, and I'm sure we'll talk much more about that and about other issues that touch on the platform in depth today. So with that, I just want to say that I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to participating. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, next, we'll hear from Kyle Martino. Um, first off, thank you to the U.S. Soccer Board for putting this on. Um, you're the boots on the ground, and I know we're going to do a lot of talking today, but uh, if we've gotten a chance to meet so far and speak on the phone, you know that I'm more interested in hearing what you guys have to say, because uh, 
we absolutely have a, 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 a inflection point right now. How we solve uh, the, the soccer part of this equation is by, I think Paul did a great job of, of, of highlighting the one area where the Federation <coughs> has, has I, I think, not serviced its members the right way by focusing too much on the top of the pyramid and not realizing that this does not trickle down and grow this game from the bottom up. And um, this is the first chance I'm getting to meet some of you in person. Uh, others I've known for a while, others I've played with and against. And uh, Steve, good luck to your, your son and your family in the Final Four. I don't know what that feels like, partly because the gentleman sitting across the table from me, Mr. Rennie, took so much out of our team before the tournament started. So <coughs> we'll get to bury the hatch a little bit today. Um, I think it's really important to understand that um, what we need in the aftermath of, of, of Trinidad and Tobago is to not highlight that moment and think that the inflection point starts there, <coughs> is to look at that as an opportunity um, to finally look in the mirror and realize that we've grown in many ways and a lot of people around this table are responsible for that, have been a part of that at many levels. Uh, but, but we can't keep looking at profit motive and we can't keep looking at surplus as a way to measure our success. We have to understand, bless you, <laughs> did I get you before? That's going to change style, I'm sorry. Um, we, we have to understand that the, the, the Federation has lost sight. They, they, they've lost the, the sight that they should have had from the beginning and I think they did have from the beginning that you are you are an organization here to serve as members, and the membership has grown, and the pyramid is larger. But with that, the disconnect has grown. And I, I think when you look at the problem we have right now, it's about integration. It's about reestablishing trust in the federation that it actually does service its members. And, and we start having discourse like this before decisions are made and passed down. And um, you know, before we get into who we need right now. I think we really have to define what we need and what we want from our federation. Um, you know, I, I want to thank the gentleman sitting on this side of the table, Greg, sorry to exclude you, uh, for, for jumping in to uh, lend their experience, lend their passion, lend their profile to trying to help move the conversation in the right direction because this is not about bad bounces, a, a bad coach decision, a bad lineup. Th that, that narrative is dangerous, and I think if we offer a course correction right now where we think we can fix this at the national team level, where we think that we just have a minor issue of, hey, you know, Italy failed to qualify for a World Cup too, so did the Netherlands, so did Chile, it happens. If, if we say that we can fix that and everything's going to be okay, I, I think that a narrative like that is detrimental to the conversation that needs to happen right now. The conversation that needs to happen right now is how do we grow our soccer culture? That's, that's who U.S. soccer is to me. The Federation, sometimes you get people talk about it as a nonprofit, other times as a corporation, sometimes it's unclear which one it is. I think we need to define what it is. And my platform um, it is, is three words, but it's not as simple as that. Transparency, equality, progress. And I'll drill into that for a moment, but I know that we'll, we'll have questions where I can get a little deeper into what I mean by that. You know, it starts with transparency. Who is the federation? What are they doing? What do we want from them? What's the good, the bad, and the ugly of the way things have been run? And I've seen this game at absolutely every level as a player. I've played rec. I've played travel, I've played high school, I've played club, I, I did ODP, I was in the, the pool games at Penn State, I made the national team, I traveled around the world as a young kid seeing the beauty of this game and where it can lead you. Uh, it took me to Boletary where I did residency before it actually became residency. I went to University of Virginia, where again, Mr. Rennie, we're going to have to have a discussion about that afterwards because you had some pretty good teams and uh, Ali Curtis I spoke to the other day says hello by the way. Um, I you know, went on to play professional, went on to play for the national team, and I don't say that because that qualifies me for this position, but what it's done is it's given me an insight into the great things being done at every level, and I'm filled with optimism that if we can bring everyone to the table and help everyone understand what their role is, what's the role in growing the game first? Because only 0.02% you know, of the kids that get into this game 
end up representing our country or playing in our professional leagues. And, 30, uh, 30 seconds, Cal. We have someone <coughs> sitting. Oh, well, uh, sorry, we have two people sitting at the table. Sorry, sorry, Mike, I'll find out your, your resume afterwards. <laughs> who uh, made our country really proud, went and represented the, the, the top of the pyramid. But I'm sure Paul and Eric are going to tell you that that's not where we need to focus on this. And that's a great message from two people who absolutely know what this pyramid looks like. Uh, I, I want to show you why a soccer visionary is what U.S. soccer needs right now. The business side is important, and no one should lose sight of it. That you should chair a board to protect those gains, but you need to chair a board to protect them against the soccer blind spot that's led us to one of the lowest points in the Federation's history. Kyle, thank you. <clears throat> now we'll hear from Michael Winograd. Sure. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you um, to the U.S. Club Soccer Board and staff for putting this on. I'm happy to appreciate it. Um, let me, let me uh, give a brief background into who I am and sort of what I've done for the last you know, several years. I played Division I college soccer, Lafayette College. I played professionally in Israel after that. When I came back to the States in 1995, the coach who had coached me my senior year in college had just accepted a job at the University of Richmond, a guy by the name of Jeff Gettler. He asked if I wanted to go coach with him down at Richmond. I did. It was the year that we were hosting the men's Final Four. It was uh, to date. I think the most well-attended men's Final Four in NCAA soccer history it was over 40,000 attendees at a, at a college soccer event. Uh, after Richmond, I signed a contract with the Rochester Rhinos. The season was due to start in a couple of months. The coach suggested I go play with the Buffalo Blizzard indoors in the interim. thought I could help them out uh, mid-season. I went there on the very first day. I blew out my knee. Uh, I took the LSATs for law school shortly after that. I had about... I couldn't apply for law school until that fall, and I couldn't go to law school the fall after that. I started working with a friend with the New York Fever. He was the general manager of the New York Fever. The owner then asked the two of us to start up a new franchise in the A-League on Staten Island, <clears throat> which we did. I handled all the soccer stuff, the entire soccer side. I was the, uh, <coughs> you know, I hired the coach. I started grassroots programs with the local soccer organizations, helped draft curricula, helped um, uh, we picked the team name, got a few names, got the community involved through a vote, through the town, through the stats on paper. Uh, my friend handled the business side, the, the stadium side. He wound up leaving to go to MLS, where he eventually became general manager of the San Jose Earthquakes in the year they won the MLS Cup. Uh, I, in 2005, played with the U.S. Maccabee Masters team. We won the silver medal in Israel. Since 2009, I've served on my local town uh, soccer association board and have coached my kids uh, for three or four years from both rec into travel, uh, both of whom want, my son is now with the DA and my daughter's with the developmental team. Uh, and now I want to just sort of bridge the soccer side to the business side. For the last 17 or 18 years, I've been a lawyer, graduated from University of Pennsylvania and Ivy League Law School with several honors, and I've worked at the absolute best law firms in the country ever since. We represent um, the biggest companies in the world in their highest stakes matters. I've represented Microsoft, I've represented Bank of America, uh, Samsung, I'm representing FedEx Supply, uh, one after another. We represent Bain Capital, uh, TPG, these are the biggest private equity firms in the world, all in their high stakes cases. <coughs> and what all of that involves is getting in front of CEOs, getting in front of executives, Figuring out strategies, and like I tell them at the beginning of almost every single case, if the parties on both sides of the table are reasonable, we should be able to resolve this and settle it. And it involves a lot of things, right? It involves intelligence, and fairness, and open-mindedness, because there are a lot of high stakes and issues when you're dealing with businesses, and there's a you know $150 million dispute. It's a very big adverse interest, but you need to bring parties together and show them a path and articulate it persuasively in a way that they can accept that it is in their best business interest and their best interest to move forward in that path together with both parties. It's something I've been doing for 17 years, and it's something that I think soccer needs right now. <clears throat> I'll speak very briefly about my platform. It's up on my website. It's been there from the beginning. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into a lot of stuff in depth. But the three pillars of my platform are the decision-making process for critical decisions. We need inclusiveness, transparency, and they need to be merit-based. We need to involve people in decisions that are being affected by those decisions. No matter how bright somebody is, he or she cannot possibly know everything 
that people with their boots on the ground have been accumulating, the knowledge they've been accumulating for years and years and years. We've got a very deep human resources in this country. We need to tap into it. U.S. soccer should not be in the business of ramming things down people's throats, and it shouldn't be in the business of dictating edicts from an ivory tower in Chicago. You have to include people in the process. I'll tell you very briefly, on a small scale, my, my local town, I live in a, in a town in northern New Jersey, and my local council asked me to head up and spearhead a, a, an ad hoc committee. And there was a deadlock about building a soccer field or a sports field and a park in our town. It had been deadlocked for years. I got involved, created a process that brought in all of the competing interested parties. Got everybody to have a say in the best way that they should come out, buy into the process, take ownership over it. And, and after three months, we have a proposal going to village council that everybody has signed on to, and it's broken a deadlock. The second thing that I want to talk about in, the, in, in terms of pillars is um, the equality of the women's game. <coughs> we can talk about that later, but frankly, I just don't even understand how it's an issue right now. The only issues, the only counter arguments I've ever heard, which are tied to revenue, I think both miss the point of U.S. soccer's mission and, and spirit, and in any event, as a matter of fact, are probably wrong. Um, and misleading, and we can talk about that in more detail. The last thing is the is player development and the fracturing that everybody knows has become a tremendous problem, and it's becoming an increasing problem. Um, that ties into reducing cost barriers, it ties into uh, bringing people on board and figuring out on a state-by-state -state basis what the best structure is. There is no one-size-fits-all solution in this country. It's too diverse demographically, geographically, 30 seconds, in terms of topography. We need to go state by state and figure out the best and most effective uh, path forward. Uh, and with that, I, you know, I, I echo something that Kyle said. You're going to hear a lot of similar, I think, uh, you'll hear all the candidates talking about some similar issues. And I think that's reflective of the fact that there are some serious uh, issues in U.S. soccer that need to be changed. Thank you, Michael. Um, our The final introduction is Eric Winalda. The beauty of being a... The last of yeah, there's only three letters. Yeah, it's the, kind of yeah, the almost, last names that could have gone after you. Kevin, thanks for uh, the invitation to the board, to, to all of you, and all, also the other candidates. Of course, Steve on the phone. Um, in the interest of not, not sounding too redundant, uh, we all do have similar outlook uh, on, on what's going on in this country. I, I would say this, and, and I'm, I'm not going to get too far into the platform, but I think we know what the problems are. But I don't think what we're, what we're going to do today is something that's probably more important than anything else, and that is start talking about the, some of the things we're doing well. I think too many times when we get in a situation like this, we start focusing on everything's wrong, let's, let's, let's burn it down. And it's not an ivory tower in Chicago. It's actually an apartment in New York. But <laughs> the truth is about our situation is that we have immense potential, and we've never been able to achieve that. There are reasons for that. As far as a guy that played for the national team or has coached the professional level, youth level, understanding, just like Michael, my kids play in the ECNL, and they, they've gone through that process, understanding what it means to be an administrator, all of the things that are the challenges, that they, these are things that we actually are doing fairly well in this country. Of course, there is a little bit of fragmentation, but I think this is all the, the, the beauty of this job, or what it's going to entail, is someone that brings people together. And this is a, a wonderful opportunity to exchange ideas for us to, to understand exactly um, where do we go from here. I, I think that's, that's a, a massive part of this. But some of the things just specific to what we're going to talk about today is, and, and we talk about culture, but not a lot of people understand what that means. Creating a culture uh, from the bottom up. What this particular uh, organization does better than anybody is you want you understand the importance of club. What is that? You want to teach kids to play for the national team? Teach them to understand the importance of a culture of a club in the first place. We could talk about solidarity payments and all that other stuff later, but until we start teaching our kids the importance of why they're playing this game, uh, not necessarily always how to play this game because we, we get caught up in and some coaching aspects that, that, that sometimes are, they're all going to be different. But my point in all of this is it's time to reinvest in who we are and what we have been doing well. It's time to reinvest in us, whether that be at the state association level or in organizations that are trying to facilitate soccer. I think we have lost our way. Um, of course we want transparency. Of course we, we want uh, equality. And these are all things we'll talk about uh, as we move forward today. But... 
the reality is, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll get on with it, is we just need to, to figure out who we are. We need to create our identity again. We, we, ten years ago, we kind of had one. We've lost our way to a certain extent, but let's go back to the good stuff. And I would commend this board uh, and this organization uh, in that right because you understand the essence of soccer. You understand that it's, it's the way that you, you ID kids, the way that you evaluate them in their comfort zones, allowing them, giving them the opportunity to, to show us who they are and not be a detriment to their growth. I, I, so I, I think these are all good things. There is, it's not all bad. Let's just put it that way. But we do have smart people. We do have the ability to reorganize, as Michael said, uh, uh, an organization that's kind of grown a little bit more than they ever thought they would. They're sitting on $160 million of a surplus. They don't know what to do with sometimes. If we understand the soccer business, we're going to be better. The bottom line, as far as the business is concerned, when the product fails, the business suffers. We're in a stage right now where we need to get our act together. Thank you, Art. Mr. Sweeney. All right, again, thank you, gentlemen, very much for coming. We greatly appreciate your, your time and your efforts, and again, individually, for you guys just simply to be stepping up and have the opportunity to be able to take on the role that is there. Um, all of you briefly mentioned the point that I would like to bring out here and give you a little bit more time to, to specify it. Um, how do you see the purpose and direction of the Federation going forward in relation to its the youth environment, I will call it, all of us that are within that youth environment. Because the current one, the word that very much has come to us is mandate. So we have, we've been fortunate every once in a while to be called into a committee and to be able to, to talk and discuss. Uh, I agree very much with the point, and I can't recall who made it, so I'll apologize there. But we do have, I will start with 30 years in this particular business of living day to day, trying to figure out how to get that kid to love the culture, trying to get the kid how to do it, while figuring out how to deal with the parent. Hmm. Right? So you, you have to solve that puzzle, and if you don't have both of them, that's in there. But, again, I'll go back to the point where I do think there is a tremendous amount of resources and experience and, and talent that sits out there in the youth market that, quite simply, as the Federation has gotten more and more and more involved, that has just simply not been listened to in any meaningful way whatsoever. So why don't we start, we'll reverse the order, we'll start with Eric. Well, I think, I think a couple of us uh, did kind of touch on that, 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 that serving idea, the Federation's job is to serve. They kind of get in their own way sometimes, and then if, unfortunately they get in everybody's way. And mandate is a word that we hear, and sometimes at the professional level or at the national team level we just call it a dictator. Mm -hmm. But that's, that is something that, that needs to change. I've argued this because the culture does need to change to a certain extent because it needs to be more of a relationship and a conversation. But again, I'll go back to it. It has to be a trust. Our clubs are doing a pretty damn good job. We don't give them enough credit. And we've created an academy system that is, in my opinion, has made this a little bit more confusing, not just for our kids, but for our parents, for everybody. I am in a firm belief that um, if we can start getting out of our own way, our clubs will, will be able to do what they do best. Now, I understand that there's, you know, maybe academies should exist in the places that need them. I mean, I, I, let's face it, there's some of the clubs that, that uh, you guys are familiar with, and I've, I've seen it in Southern California. Um, they're, doing a, they're doing a good job. The kids are, are finding an identity. They're becoming the players that, and the development is, is actually happening. There's other places in the country who have much different challenges, whether that be on the adult or the youth side, or the New Mexico's of the world, the Arizona's of the world, where registration is down, membership is down, and there's not a lot of interest at times. They're the ones that need help. Federation needs to recognize where the help is needed as opposed to trying to be everywhere. So I think, that, I think we could change that. And I think there's a couple of ideas that have been offered as far as committees and whatnot. Um, but again, I think there's a trust issue there stemming from the Federation that doesn't allow people to do what they do best. And that is a huge component of this election because we need a president that understands what his role is. And his role is, of course, governed by a, a board and the decisions that are made are going to be collective decisions. But sometimes that mandate word has made us worse. So I'm with you on that. Erica, just to narrow down on that a little bit, um, just address real quickly, you've got a minute or so left, <clears throat> to what extent do you think the Federation's role is to provide resources and lead 
and to what extent is it to actually run programs? And I don't obviously I don't mean the national team program. I'm talking about right, that. right. Well, I, I think that there is a solution here. And when I talk about the federations' uh, inclusion at the youth level, uh, they, they become. A, we all know that there's a a registration war waging, waging right now, and, and that sometimes that gets in the way of what exactly we're trying to do. The administrative side is getting in the way of the development side. But the role of the Federation is, is very simple, is to assist and to help clubs do their do what they do best. And I, I think there is also another uh, a part of this, I can't believe I'm saying this publicly, but I don't think that the Federation needs to be a collection agency when it comes to registration. I think that money needs to go back as a resource because it really isn't a big bucket when we're honest about it. We're talking about registration, it's three, maybe 38 to 4.2% of the total money that comes in. That money could be better well served when it's given back uh, to the people who need it, to organizations like yourself who, who can actually figure out. Because that's when we are able to create facilities. We are able to create club environments. And, you know, Sean and I go way back because of our German uh, experience. But when you go to Germany, you understand the club that you play for. Create, recreating that, re that's how our players get better. It's not always from coaching. Sometimes it's just the climate. Sometimes it's the environment that you're able to create. We need to do what we can as a federation to figure out to reallocate that money to make those situations happen. Thanks, Eric. <coughs> Michael? So, Mike, let me, let me you know, the, the, the word that jumps to mind is governance. And what I mean by that is this, and, and I, I, I say this, in, it, it, this carries across to any industry. I say this when I'm interviewing law students for jobs. There are different ways to do things. And that ties into, Eric was talking about culture. And that's not just the culture within players. That's the culture that starts at the top on the business side as well. There are companies, there are governments that are run like dictatorships. You can like them or not like them. It's a different way of doing things. I think the way to run U.S. soccer is not as a dictatorship, not issuing edicts. It is through an inclusive process. When you, when you create that inclusive process, draw on the human resource of the, in this country, you're going to solve most of that. It's not about what power U.S. soccer does or doesn't have, because we could probably all debate that. We can look through the bylaws and figure out, you know, the, our U.S. government can't figure out which laws the president, you know, what the president's authority is and is not. But like I said from the beginning, it shouldn't get to that, because U.S. soccer should not be ramming things down people's throats. And so I think in terms of that inclusive culture, figuring out, you know, how decisions are made. We can talk about Klinsman being hired in the first place and whether he should have been you know, given an extension. We can talk about birth year decisions, referee administration. You can all have different views on, on, on the, the right and on the merits of those decisions. What, what concerns me is how were those decisions made and by whom were they made? Who was included? And one quick example. You know, I, I, I was at the, the game when the US lost to Costa Rica at Red Bull Arena. I've had season tickets to the Red Bulls for several years. It was exciting to bring my family to that game. I was excited the game was there. There are clearly merits to whether that game should have been played and should not have been played at that game. At that stage. What's that? At that stage. At that stage, sorry, at that stage. The fact that Bruce Arena came out after that game and said he wasn't consulted, that the head coach of the U.S. national team wasn't consulted about where to play a home game in a vital stretch in one of the most important games that the, club, that the team has played is mind-boggling to me. And that's probably indicative of how decisions are made there. You may like that system. I don't. I don't think it'll work here. And in terms of the role of the Federation, just to touch on something, Kevin, that you raised, you know, one of the things that jumps out, and I'm not going to repeat a lot of the things that Eric said, and I think he's right about that, it, companies get involved. Companies that govern sometimes get involved in actually providing products. It happens. But the key is that creates a conflict. When there are conflicts, that's okay. Conflicts happen in life. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're disqualifying, sometimes they're not. But you need processes and transparency to deal with those conflicts to make sure things are on a level playing field. And we, I'm sure we'll talk about the youth structures later on, but it's no different than you know, U.S. soccer may have U, U.S. youth. This is the United States. If a company or a person thinks, hey, you know what, I can do it better, that person is entitled to try. She can go do it and she may succeed. It's what this country is built on. We need transparency, we need an even playing field, and we need minimum standards that I think in leadership from, from U.S. soccer to talk about the things that are important. But you can't stifle competition, and you can't govern with an iron fist, and you can't sort of, 
you know, take on this patrician style where you're just dictating how everything should happen. Thanks, Michael. <coughs> Kyle? Um, I, was, I was flying here today, and uh, I was on the plane, and, and just the Wi-Fi didn't work, so I had a lot of time to think. And um, I, I, I almost kind of laughed out loud to myself. The, the, this, this meeting right now, <clears throat> I think it perfectly encapsulates the problem with how the Federation is being run currently, where... It, 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 ha it has become a bit of a competitor as opposed to a conduit for good ideas and discourse where <clears throat> decisions are made in an inclusive way because the decisions that are made at the soccer house, and I agree, the problem is we're not really sure who's making those decisions and sometimes they're unilaterally made by people not qualified. And forget if they're qualified or not to pick a head coach of a national team, no one should individually do anything like that. Um, why I laughed is because... Uh, here, here we have the exact situation that happens in, in our soccer landscape where um, you're asking the members to travel all over the country on their own dime because the Federation hasn't figured out a better way to identify talent and take the cost away from, from the membership. Why is the Federation not setting this up? I mean, why, why do you have to have the impetus and, and show the initiative? Thank you for doing it because we're going to talk about issues today that I'm glad this is going to be beamed out and everyone can hear what this conversation is about, but it concerns me that the Federation doesn't feel it necessary to, to facilitate conversations like this. And, and I think it speaks to what I'm hearing on the phone time and time again with delegates. There's a disconnect, and, and there is a, a feeling of you're, you're paying to be a part of the country club, but you're not allowed on the golf course. And... Um, all of a sudden, we have a system that's talking about national team players, and in this situation, focusing too much on the men's national team, and I think Michael did a great job of illustrating one of the big problems is we do have World Cup winners, and we do have world-class athletes, and we treat them like uh, second-class citizens in terms of not giving them equal pay and not giving our incredible women the same opportunities, the same access to facilities, and they are the Spain, the Brazil, the Argentina, on the women's side, but ask any of them, and they resent the fact that their success is being used to paper over cracks because other countries are catching up and surpassing them. When I was little, I played on Christine Lilly Field in Wilton. I dreamed of being Mia Hamm or, or Diego Maradona. I have a little daughter, and it shouldn't take having a daughter to see that those are future athletes. But here's the problem, and, and Eric, you made a couple of great points. There's just one area that I disagree, disagree with. We're not shaping our next national team players. That's not the Federation's job. The Federation's job is to grow this game. 99.9% .9 of our members are never going to put on a U.S. jersey. And we have two people who, who are part of a very exclusive and very uh, prestigious group. But, but they played with, along the way, many people who dropped out of the game because we stopped servicing the soccer culture. We stopped growing the game in the area that's the biggest part of the pie. I mean, our development pool is a, is a massive glacier, right? And, and, and what we do is we throw it in boiling hot water and hope that it doesn't melt. And we keep adding to the temperature instead of realizing that, listen, we're not trying to find the next Christian Pulisic, Landon Donovan, Eric Winolda. That, that is part of the process for sure. But if we're focusing on that, what we're doing is losing the biggest part of our soccer culture to other sports, whether it be barrier to entry because of cost, which I thought you did a great job, Michael, of illustrating cost, access, that means playing fields. You look at the line items of club teams, and I'm telling you something you already know, one of the biggest expenses is to get that field, 25% most of the time, Ten of seconds. your overall cost. So I, I think we need to identify who the federation is again. We know what it was supposed to be, but it's not that anymore. And what we need is a federation who spends the time on the phone, as I've done, for an hour and a half on, on average, all day, every day, with, with uh, people from associations and part of this culture that are growing the game, not asking for their nomination, but asking for their opinion, because they haven't gotten that phone call a lot recently. And I'll steal something that uh, Gordon Henderson said in Columbus with the youth organization there. He said, integration. There's no integration. The PDI that was passed down, by the way, the birth chart was wrong initially when they sent it to you. And that just shows how tone deaf it is. Page three of a 53-page document in the, in the performance or the player development initiative. On page three, it says we should not treat our 12-year-olds like World Cup players. 
And that's kind of where I was saying, Eric, I disagree. Uh, but we are. We're, we're absolutely to trying to identify kids at a young age and get them on the path to play in World Cups. I mean, that is not how you build a soccer culture. Sorry. <coughs> um, Steve, the, the question once again is uh, really what's the proper role of the Federation? Should it be providing leadership and resources and standards? Uh, or should it be running programs that directly um, intersect with the youth space? Thanks for repeating that, Kevin. Um, you know, I largely agree with my colleagues here. And, you know, two, two words come to mind, um, process and substance. And what I can say in this case is that the, the edicts, and having lived that as a DA parent and, and board member and otherwise, the edicts that come down from above without um, any process, uh, or they manifest the attenuation that the people making decisions have from the reality, uh, is a loser on both counts. First of all, I go out on my listening tour and I hear from so many delegates about how they feel not part of the process, about how they have decisions uh, thrust upon them, like the current F SRA, uh, a potential mandate, and that sort of thing. But that's not fair. That's not workable. It's not the way an organization is supposed to be run. I agree with Michael in terms of talking about the autocratic nat nature of it. That doesn't work because um, it's not the way a good organization, especially a nonprofit organization, is supposed to work. From a substance perspective, I can tell you in just focusing narrowly on the Development Academy, there are some decent parts of the Development Academy, but there are some absolutely, utterly ridiculous parts of the Development Academy. And the ridiculous parts developed based on additional strictures that came down every couple of months, at least in my tenure with the Development Academy as a parent, that, that maybe made sense from 30,000 square feet, but make no sense in substance in terms of developing productive players. Um, Development Academy, in my opinion, is largely turning out technically sound players without joy, and that just doesn't work. You, you can't be a great player without joy. In terms of, you know, the question about what's the role of the feder Federation, well, I'm looking at two parts of my platform now under, under fairness. My platform is leadership, fairness, and reform, and that's in response to what I've heard from delegates about what they want. And under fairness, you better believe that the surplus is going to be used and should be used by the Federation uh, to go back to the constituents. We have an inverse relationship, the most money in surplus ever, and, and the most dramatically bad result ever. So what's the value of hoarding it? So certainly the Federation should be providing resources to defray pay-to-play to help the, the different organizational members institute their programs. In terms of the, the competitiveness that has developed, I agree with Kyle. It's not the role, it's not the role of the Federation to be a competitor. Uh, we have a system that needs to be tweaked um, we don't have a system that needs to be blown up. The other part of my, of my platform under fairness that I'm looking at is that, you know, I want to immediately create a, a task force of youth state associations and affiliates, national affiliates, to address and solve the current counterproductive issue going on. There was a, a, a major youth a state association uh, board member who, who drew a great metaphor for me, and that was a line, and above that line was 4 million, the number 4 million in terms of registered players. And then he put three, it was a horizontal line, and he put three vertical lines. And those three vertical lines went to, uh, you know, the, the three major uh, sanctioning organizations and carding organizations. And the point, his point was that the Federation does not look beneath that top line. And in my administration, the Federation will look between, beneath that uh, top line such that this issue will be solved. It's a zero-sum game to have the same sanctioning organizations fighting for the same players, leagues, and clubs. There is a way to build a tent. You know, there is a way to build a tent. And, you know, I know you guys in particular have, uh, have formed this new thing called the ENPL, which is an effort at a tent in, insofar as NPL and ECNL coming together. And I think it's a great example of a first step in that regard. Because the the... <coughs> The, Ten the seconds, Steve. Massachusetts does not need two state cups right now. Okay, and so we have to we have to build this together. We have to have the federation 
be involved in a way that is guiding and not competitive. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Paul? Well, I think it's fair that um, we first answer some tough questions and really ask ourselves what would be the purpose for the United States Soccer Federation to run comp competing uh, youth programs with its members. And when we ask that question, one thing comes to mind. It's about revenues. And they utilize the United States Developmental Academy to tap into those revenues, specifically creating a deeper competition than just the movement of players from these organizations or competing with programs such as ID2. It's clearly taking those finances out of the organizations. And as it grows to eight, le eight age groups, where before we were told it was only two age groups, at 16 boys and 18 boys, um, it's now going to go to eight, and it's on the it's on the um, the December 10th to go to vote. So every age group from 12 to 19, both boys and girls, and it's proposed to go three deep. So it's potentially some of these clubs that we see the super clubs or mega clubs that some people say could potentially have 48 teams that leave. U.S. club soccer or leave United States Youth Soccer Association for eternity. Projections are by 2019 that 2 million kids will be directly registering for U.S. soccer directly and eliminating these organizations in effort. If we times $50 in registration times 2 million, you equal the $100 million per year that those revenues will go directly into U.S. soccer. So when we're talking about surpluses of money upward $150 million now, it makes sense when we hear to grow the U.S. Soccer Federation to $500 million in four years. There's your number. So the purpose is it for development. And one of the biggest reasons I decided to run for president was to define that word. Is de development a gaming circuit? Is it meant to build revenues? Or is it what many people, U.S. club soccer being the leaders in this category, to develop players, to develop clubs, to develop coaches, referees? And those are the four areas we truly need to focus on. In terms of the United States Soccer Federation, I don't believe it should be running programs in competition with its members, but certainly assisting. And that's when I opened up with the statement, in align U.S. soccer with its members, not the other way around. Particularly, I would like to see in the grassroots level. And before I say particularly in the grassroots level, I look at two, two ends of this. Grassroots is everything going well and everything is going great at the moment a player touches the ball or decides to sign up for soccer. And if we here as experts say, yeah, everything's fine, and there's no need for change. Then we look at the highest level, and let's leave out the men's national team not qualifying, but let's just look at our pro league, major league soccer, and say, is that the final project, uh, product? Is this league one of the greatest leagues in the world? Is it thriving on uh, television revenues or TV audience? Ten seconds, Paul. <clears throat> the answer is no. And my objective is, yes, let's do everything we possibly can, starting at the grassroots level and at the professional level, to build this game to be the leaders in the world. So we can have the best professional league, and we give kids at the very start a simple opportunity to pass and receive the ball properly before they move on two to three years down the road to tie it all in together. Yeah, can I just add one thing real quick? Because we all mentioned a couple of buzzwords that are coming out, you know, DA and, and PDI. And I, and I know all of us would like to kind of be a little more descriptive of what exactly the issue is and how it relates to the, the, the landscape. You know, the Development Academy being created, it's another example of, before we even get into was this the right or the wrong decision, it was a decision made without the input of so many people in the soccer space. So you will get, and I have uh, one of my close friends, the academy that I grew up in is now in the DA, and he'll tell me a lot of complaints about the way it's being run, a meritocracy based a little bit more on results rather than performance, which 
actually stymies the progress of players. The fact that the creation of, of the Development Academy has created a very affordable option for the, the professional clubs that are doing it for free. And I spent a couple hours with Claudia Reyna recently to find out what they're doing. And it's wonderful what's happening, but here's what's happening to the people that are still running in the pay-to-play model, is it's actually made it more expensive for them. So the Development Academy means they've got to travel around much more. Their cost goes up. Where does that cost go? Many of them have to pass that down to, to, to the players, meaning the parents. So we want to make the game more affordable. We just made a decision that actually makes it actually more expensive in many markets. And forget the fact that maybe they have a better option 15 minutes down the road than two hours down the road. We haven't even gotten into that discussion yet because there was a decision made without the people who could really help us understand that. And I think the birth chart thing is perfect to, un to understand this. Just, just absolutely encapsulates the problem. Here's a decision made that seems to contradict that third slide I was saying, that we're not molding you know, World Cup winners in, at 12 years old. Then why are you splitting up best friends based on a chart that, that absolutely makes no sense to the people that operate in that space, not to mention send the wrong chart, which is embarrassing to begin with, and also have no idea that associations aren't paying attention to that. Some associations are basically just saying, you know what, you don't understand my space, you didn't ask my opinion, so I'm going to do it the way I know how because Connecticut, Colorado, Massachusetts, it all have a different landscape. And, and you talked about the... the the size of our country obviously is a challenge geographically. I mean, the size of Europe, but we're trying to we're trying to do what Germany did as World Cup winners with two billion dollars after a Euro failure, and they're the size of Oklahoma. I mean, 390 center of excellences and 1,200 full-time coaches and a thousand scouts. I mean, we we don't have anywhere let's, near that, and we're the size of Europe. Kyle, let's move on because we we have a number, and and we're going to get into some of the details and some of those questions further. But now, Mike, Mike Cullen has got a question. Thank you all, uh, gentlemen, for being here and highlight gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, there's no females in the room. Uh, Shannon is on the phone. We talk about the fracture in, in the youth game, but I think one of the things that the PDIs or the mandates, however you want to call them, brought out was the fact that USU soccer, AYSO, US club soccer, uh, USA, uh, say... USA Futsal and recently United Soccer Coaches decided we would start getting together in December of 2015. And the, the tech, Youth Technical Working Group has been meeting quarterly with representatives from all of those organizations since December of 2015 when USU Soccer hosted the first meeting in Frisco. That group has been stuck in this nebulous of meeting and talking what is your position on the fact that these groups can and are willing to work together, formalizing those partnerships with the Federation to have actual technical working committees that have some authority, that have actual input, um, and have meaningful and transparent discussions, understanding the experts on the ground in various parts of the country in various levels of the game, to now affect policy as it relates to the youth game in this country. To the group? How are we doing it this time? Uh, <laughs> we're going to start with uh, Michael. Sure. <clears throat> you know, this is, this is the goal, right? And, and, and what you need to do is once you have that system in place where the parties, the interested parties, are all sharing their input and, and sharing their knowledge and figuring out what's best for, for soccer in this country, right? You need to make sure that you give them authority. You need to actually implement the recommendations that they make. And you can't do this for show. You can't just say, hey, listen, we're going to put you guys, you know, let, it, let us know, guys. Go off in a room somewhere, talk about the issues, talk about the best structure, and let us know. And then just ignore them. Sorry, Michael, can I interrupt? I, I do want to highlight the fact that the Federation does send representatives to each of these meetings. Absolutely. To so be fair. My point is not just to have representatives there but you need to actually implement what comes out of that, that process. And so what you're describing is, is what I, and I think most would agree, what I've been saying for a very long time is we need, and it's the first pillar in my platform, which is we need an inclusive process. We need the people that are being affected by decisions. We've talked about some of them, we can talk about a lot more. We need the people that are being affected by decisions to actually have input into what those decisions are. Not just 
so that they take ownership of the decisions, but because they have a lot of knowledge to share. You know, Kyle was talking about the birth year. I mean, it's one of those baffling decisions that when you see what it does to kids in third grade who are doing it for all the right reasons, maybe have no aspirations to play on a national team, maybe not even competitively, maybe they're playing rec, maybe they're just playing their travel, you know, the, the competitive travel team, to be split apart for, for some minute fraction of the soccer playing population seems silly. And I would have to think, I'd have to imagine that if you had that inclusive process that you're talking about with team, where that process had teeth, I, I would like to think that decisions like that probably would have come out differently. And, and so what you're describing is, is exactly what has to happen. It's what, it's what I've been doing for 17 years. It's bringing parties together and getting their input. And it's hard work. It takes perseverance. I'm sure you know. I'm sure when you guys all first met, there was not a tremendous amount of trust across the table. It takes earning trust, earning respect, perseverance, intelligence, hard work. But when you put that work in with the objective of actually utilizing what comes out of the process, I think you will begin to, you'll, you'll begin to form the process that I've been talking about and that others have been talking about, which is that inclusive process, transparent, that everybody is going to buy into. And then you, by, by, by that process alone, you avoid the edicts. There's no need to dictate from an apartment or an ivory tower. Because people are making the decisions in the best interest of all of them, they're all on the same page. It, it's almost, you, you've got things on auto, you know, on autopilot. <coughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, Kyle? Um, so, where, where, where I run into a big issue, and one of the reasons that, that I've come into this, and I'm willing to, to, to leave my dream job to try to solve a dream I had when I was a kid that one day this this game that I'd fallen in love with accidentally a bit a little bit I had a Notre Dame family and my dad wanted me to be Rocket Ishmael not uh, <laughs> you know not Johan Cruyff so um, I, I'm fearful of that dream because we all of a sudden have a situation where uh, as as a federation I want to first make sure that we get back to the, the, the who, not the who we need, but the what do we need moving forward. And what we need moving forward is to empower the infrastructure we already have. Not, not to create a new one, and also not to control it from, from the, the, the soccer house. Um, I had a wonderful call with the entire board, um, the South Carolina youth, and uh, you'll know many of them, and Hans, the day after Thanksgiving, got nine of his members on the phone, and it, it basically filled me with so much optimism for the future if we finally as a federation plug into the infrastructure that exists instead of asking everyone else to kind of follow US Soccer Federation's direction and why on earth would any of these associations follow the direction of someone that hasn't asked their opinion and hasn't asked how they can serve them better so I sat on the phone with those nine members um, the day after Thanksgiving and just listened and it was amazing the, the quality of technical input and foresight and coordination. Now, there's a spectrum, right? There, all of our associations aren't run that way, not because they don't want to or not because we don't have qualified people, but, you know, Chris Lacey up in Wisconsin, I spent an hour and a half with him on the phone. He's gotten into the game recently because his kids love it. He's kind of out on an island by himself and doing such a great job to try and catch up and be a association basically by himself. So the Federation needs to work to bring other associations up to speed, to use their infrastructure and their surplus, so that the way we divide and conquer is by having this, is by having U.S. club soccer, and I know U.S. youth soccer does it as well. I talked with Chris Duke. You guys regionalize it, and you know more than we possibly can about what's going on out there. So what we have right now is, is a is a situation where we have a, a president who has done so many great things to try and grow the game, and there are a lot of business accomplishments, and we absolutely have to protect those, but trying to be the expert in all categories. And we don't need that, and that's not beneficial to us moving forward, because no one can be the expert. This is a very nuanced situation. So we need to empower a president to try and grow the soccer culture by picking someone who has the wisdom to identify what the issues are, the courage to tackle them, but the humility to admit they don't have all the answers. And what they're going to do is finally reach out to the people in the soccer community who have been growing it for, for decades 
and ask them, what can we do to help? Not, not we, what's up with your membership fees? Can we get those? I agree with Eric. I mean, if you're making 50 million, if you're clearing that on Copa America and you're making close to half a million every friendly, Time's we up. don't really have to start asking our membership that we're not serving well to send us a, a tiny portion of a pie that we've been able to grow. Um, <clears throat> Eric? Oh, back to me, huh? <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> I just kidding. The, uh, how should the Federation better work with the youth members in particular to um, institutionalize a process right. of getting input and achieving consensus before well, decisions are made? We, we all know this because we've been involved in the Federation for as long as we have, some of us longer than others, whether that be at the top level or in, in the youth sphere of this. But the decisions that the way they've been made have been... Uh, and that mandate, again, all this really calls for is a president who has the wisdom not just to identify stuff, but to, to find the right people who would delegate those energies appropriately. Right now, we don't have enough, if you could have called boots on the ground or people working uh, on these kind of things. We don't have enough. We don't have a connector. It can't always be uh, the Federation just, just is... It has one point of view, and then a bunch of guys go in a room, and no, no answer really comes out of that. There has, and I, I don't know who those representatives are, but my uh, contention has always been that if we're going to make soccer decisions, we need to start making them with soccer people. Enough said. <clears throat> um, Steve, laugh a little. I have to laugh a little, and it's not a happy laugh um, because thematically we see the same thing for every constituency. On the one hand, you know, my head is swimming, and I think everyone's head is swimming, with how many issues are, are out there to solve. Uh, but if you distill it down, it's so much similar to one issue, which is to say respect for constituents and true respect and listening and hearing and, and, and providing and responding to their input. My first trip after I announced in May, presumptively announced in May, was with, uh, to Dallas to meet with youth constituents. And I sat down in my first meeting and I was, said, I was told, why are you here? We don't matter. That was the first thing. It was a rhetorical question, obviously. And the reality is when we started to talk about it, I learned about the plight of most constituents under the rule of the current federation. And the reality is that they don't feel respected that they work hard and they feel patronized. And, you know, this is something that needs to be solved. I think the question specifically had to do with the Youth Council Technical Working Group, but it could be, you know, transposed everywhere in almost every constituency. It happens to be, and I'll read a short sentence because it's in my platform, I will institute an atmosphere on the Youth Council Technical Working Group that welcomes and encourages feedback where a national team staff listens and is more interactive and transparent in establishing player development initiatives. And why is that in there? It's in there in response to hearing that members of, of that Youth Council Technical Working Group have felt patronized. And, and members of, of, of the youth, you know, state associations have felt patronized. And you guys, I'm sure, to an extent, have felt patronized. And, and so have the adult state association. And it isn't right. Kyle uh, raises a, an important word, once again, humility. And humility is not being demonstrated currently. And that's another reason why there is such a critical mass call for change. I once sat on the board of advisors of the Boston National Public Radio affiliate. And that board was largely made up of underwriters. My company underwrote was one of the major underwriters with a major bank in, in Boston and my company. And in the end, we cared so much about the fate of the National Public Radio Station, but, but we realized that we were just being patronized and none of our input was being instituted. It was just sort of a situation where they wanted us to continue underwriting. And most of us ultimately, sadly, resigned because all of our efforts were falling on deaf ears. This theme you hear everywhere. If you're going to do the work and you're going to volunteer and you're going to create <coughs> PDI recommendations on the Youth Council Technical Working Group, well, by golly, they're really going to be listened to. And to the extent that, the national team staff doesn't listen or dismisses or acts holier than thou, then they'll, they'll have the problem. I've run companies. I'm a really benevolent boss. But when employees don't respect their constituents, 
then, then the benefit of the doubt is not with them. So this is the thematic thing that we're hearing from every, every constituency. And I think, you know, under when we get change here, I think new administration is absolutely going to show much more humility and much more respect for the constituency. So the work that people do in good faith will be listened to. It doesn't mean everything will be implemented, but it won't be a situation where you automatically have it fall in deaf ears. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. Cal? Can you please uh, repeat that question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so there was a group <clears throat> that came together, an ad hoc group that came together, basically repre uh, representatives of all of the youth uh, organizations, USYSA, US Club, ASO, SAY, USSSA, and then later uh, United Soccer Coaches <clears throat> joined as well. That group has met quarterly, uh, and it does meet with members of the Federation staff. <clears throat> But it has no, there's no clearly understood authority. Um, there's no um, anticipated outcomes necessarily from those meetings. So the question is, should the Federation institute a more formal process of, uh, and a sustaining process of getting input from the youth members in particular and, uh, and um, you know, uh, institutionalize that? And appreciate the more clarification on that question and just the fact that we're having that question presented to the candidates here and then on the phone is um, striking because certainly it's not happening and obviously I wasn't there and I imagine the other candidates here were not in that room and don't know what took place in there but based on the question itself it's um, presented where that kind of line of communication and leadership is not happening. And certainly it's, a, it's, it's fascinating because <coughs> that is the duties and the, and the roles of a United States Soccer Federation leadership and board, including the Athletes Council, which I served on and also was served on the board of directors um, back in 2008. Um, it's, uh, it brings to mind in terms of solutions of if those things are not happening, what kind of proposals could be made to talk about and discuss? And it all goes back to there's an opportunity here to take the United States Developmental Academy and put it under the Olympic Developmental Program. So now these conversations are geared and structured automatically because it's under the members versus controlled by the United States Soccer Federation and dictated into the attitude where we don't have to listen, we got our agenda, we show up, it's a courtesy. With that said, there's some things like a co conduct a comprehensive <coughs> analysis and minor minority participation um, that represents the United States soccer system in general and engagement of these segments. And when I did the study on myself, I learned there was over 500,000 males youth males in Southern California that were non-registered U.S. soccer members. And those are meaningful discussions, I think, that could be brought to the table to discuss with the minds to be at this youth segment. And when I think having an umbrella of Olympic Developmental Program to work with, I start thinking about high school coaches. And I think high school coaches could be our eyes. They could be scouts if they're properly trained and given guidance. And Imagine the players we find in high school. Already, club coaches and directors are starting to coach in high school, and they're finding those players for their own organizations or their own clubs. And they have access to facilities as well. It makes sense we do it in a more meaningful way. And looking at the multiculture, the diversities, and, and really target um, the non-U.S. soccer registered players in terms of some substance growth. With that said... I believe having steering committees from that large group of people that could lead U.S. soccer in furthering and deepening discussions should be led and should be discussed one month prior to the grants that are to be filled out with U.S. Soccer Foundation or the Innovation Fund grants. Meeting one month before, three times a year, will also allow members to hear what comes out of that steering committee, what comes out of these Ten organizations that we have, and how can they benefit if they could qualify for a grant? Thank you. Um, 
before we move on to another question from our one of our <coughs> board members, it'll be Sh Sean Blakeman will be asking the next question after this one. This is from one of our members. <coughs> um, a, a little bit of an introduction. You may or may not know that in order to be on the board of U.S. Club Soccer, um, the, one of the requirements or several of the requirements include you have to have played uh, either professionally or in college. You have to have at least a B license, U.S. Soccer B license or equivalent, and you need to have been a DOC of a club for at least five years. <clears throat> so with that being said as an introduction, for our board, issues of coaching education are extremely important. <clears throat> that's, that's where these gentlemen come from, and, and Shannon as well. Um, that's really very much in their DNA. So the question is, how can U.S. soccer help coaches at the grassroots level? And this comes from Chris Lewis from the Tinley Park Bobcats Soccer Club in Illinois. <clears throat> how can U.S. soccer help coaches at the grassroots roots level to have more accessibility to coaching education options, economical coaching education options, certification, and ongoing education? <clears throat> we'll start with Eric. <clears throat> well, it's a... It's a it's something that this organization has taken great uh, attention to, um, and to remind everybody of that. Not just um, and some of those ideas are are need to be made affordable. Um, whether that be taking a group of guys to go to, to Fiorentina to see you know, see what they do in, in different places, and not a lot of people are doing that. And I understand that that's not going to be a feasible option for everybody. But I, I I'll go back to. What I, what I, I don't know if you guys understood what I meant by it, but when you teach our younger players to understand what it means to play for their club and for their shirt and to have an identity to have, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm saying to you that that's all the way to the national team. What it does is it creates a respect within. Creating those environments is probably more important than anything else. I would argue the point that there are too many times that we put so much of an onus on coaching that we overcoach. And we don't allow our coaches uh, essentially the opportunity to let to, to let games, especially at the younger age, uh, to let those games happen, to facilitate games as opposed to uh, essentially try to get in their heads at, at an early age. So understanding the role of a coach is what this organization does a pretty damn good job of. I have to say that to the, to the rest of the country, to all of the the, the other uh, existing organizations, how much have they put? Uh, into that, how much onus do they put on the, the understanding of the role of a, of a coach slash manager and or facilitator of a game? Um, the federation, again, because they, they have, uh, and there's been numerous uh, instances where we've, we've we used to tell our coaches what to do from the federation standpoint. There was a wrong answer. There, that was the way it worked. You would go and you'd take, I took my A, I took my B, and I, I remember that there was a certain format that I had to and I, I didn't agree with it. And my take on that was is that coaches all also, just as our players do, need to have the opportunity to find out who they are, what are their strengths as a coach, and to become, <clears throat> to find their own identity. So there is, again, this goes back to trust. This goes back, it's not a dictation. It's, it's an opportunity for coaches to grow within themselves. I like, I like the idea of, of the exchange part. I mean, having the, to answer the question of how can we make it more accessible there are plenty of opportunities in there. Not, we are not doing enough. I think this organization does a pretty good job of it. But I do think their um, coaching will always be what it should be. And I won't say who it was, but somebody at this table said this to me. Is, I never stop learning. I never stop learning as a coach. That has got to be the attitude. You constantly have to be in the pursuit of, of information to, to understand all the aspects of it. That's all we can do provide those platforms for people to, to become, just as we want our players to, to have an identity and, and express themselves. Coaches need to have that. They need to keep it within the framework of reality, but they also need to uh, be afforded that opportunity to, um, to grow as coaches. It's a very important component of this. And some people do it better than others, clearly. Eric, let me just ask a follow-up that each of you can then incorporate into your answers, <clears throat> maybe a, just a little more detail. Um, one of the issues that's really arisen uh, in, in recent years in particular is the cost associated with getting the license. So the, getting the A license in the U.S. is going to, with travel and so forth, not counting all the other steps along the way, it'll end up costing about $9,000 for a coach. Um, I thought there was no A license left. Sorry? Wasn't a Pro Plus license? No, there's, a, there's still an A license. Um, 
it's it's yeah, it's, it's not intended for professional coaches. You're, you're actually hitting it on the head right now, just the fact that there is three of them now is the reason why it's costing right. as much as it. And um, how do you feel about that issue? Well, when we look at Europe, we find that the countries that have the lowest cost have the most licenses. Spain has the lowest cost and the most licenses. England has the highest cost and the fewest licenses. Um, so our, so to add to your answer, Eric, and then everybody else can, can add it as well, what role do you think the Federation needs to play in ensuring that cost isn't a barrier? Right. Well, cost is, well, we, whether it's pay-to-play, and people don't have a, they have a misunderstanding of that uh, concept as well. But clearly, this is this is going to be an issue. If you look at, and I mentioned it before, the, the five main buckets where the Federation makes its money, it's television revenue, it's the, the national team programs, and then way down at the bottom, it's there's that piece, uh, which is going to be for registration of players, referees, and coaches. It's not a big number. And if we're going to brag, again, about a surplus of $160 million and we want to really invest in the game, this is where we have another opportunity to make this a heck of a lot more cost efficient. So my my take on that is um, clearly to lower the number. I mean, there, there are there are levels to this. I, I went through it. I'm for, well, I didn't have to pay for it because I played for my country over 50 times. Is, I, is that the way that works? So that's that's another, you know, they encourage people that have played for the national team to, to go back in, and the federation paid for that, which I'm very appreciative of. However, way too expensive. And I probably um, shouldn't mention this, but I remember overhearing a conversation within the federation when I was taking the A license course that it was almost a preconceived notion that 20% were going to pass anyway. And I thought to myself, well, that's an odd thing to say. What if 85% of these coaches were good enough? Well, only 20 are going to pass. That mindset right there gives the illusion of it's a money grab, which is, is not the kind of perception that we want to have and or we want to facilitate a way to make it a heck of a lot cheaper for our coaches. So, uh, Steve Gans, uh, the question again is um, what should the Federation be doing to ensure accessibility to coaching, uh, licensing, certification, and continuing education, particularly paying attention to the cost? Well, first of all, you know, we need to coach the coaches, Kevin, which I know is something you say and your organization has been a champion behind, and it absolutely is the case. Resources have to be devoted to that, uh, for sure. To step back for a minute and to answer the literal question uh, submitted, because I think it was at, at the very early youth uh, end, you know, what's one of the quintessential problems we see in American soccer? We've all seen it. I, I once almost wrote a book called Soccer for the Anxious American Parent. Anyone who's been an age group coordinator has gotten a call from a parent who was assigned coaching at an intramural level in their town, and the parent has said, I can't coach because I don't know anything about it. If it were baseball or basketball, I could do it. And then you as the age group coordinator have to say, well, if you don't coach, then there can be no team. And that's how most parents get involved as coaches in the, in the sport. It's a unique problem to soccer in this country. Having a catch with your dad in the backyard is, is quintessential American experience. And I think on the other end of it, soccer is often frustrated by the fact that parents are very anxious. So what we need to do is establish a very important early pathway for parents and coaches, people who want to be coaches or coaches who want to be better coaches. We have to increase that pathway for sure. Uh, my my understanding right now is the gateway is not consistent. The cost is, is exceedingly high. Kevin, you said nine thousand. I heard a horror story. Depending on travel, where it might cost twelve thousand uh, to, to get an A license, depending on where where you're having to travel. But the barrier at the top end financially is way too high, and the the rules and pathway for people who want to advance is too inconsistent. So I think that the efforts. U.S. Club has made to champion that should be applauded. I've known Lynn Burling for 30 years, obviously from Soccer America, but but I identify as well with it, what the challenges that NFCAA faces, and I think that their input, again, another constituency that has unique knowledge, should be respected uh, in this process. What could be worse? You know, I analogize again to me being on the board of the Boston radio station. What could be worse than caring about something deeply and passionately? and yet not having your, your input, your substantial experience, 
be respected. So I think that the, the cost needs to be uh, absolutely um, looked at for people at the higher levels, and the pathway has to be improved uh, and, and made more accessible for people at the earlier levels and throughout. Michael, question to you. Yeah, so, so this is this is an important question, and it's something that I've I always lumped together and have done so from the beginning with pay to play, and it's about the the cost barriers and, and, and allowing access, and the picture that, that I want to paint is, you know, the, one of the keys to player development is getting players in front of good coaches as early as possible. Take a kid who's graduating college, like four years, Division One college soccer, she's a great player, she's decided to go to a different career path, she wants to stay involved. You're going to tell a recent college graduate who, out of the goodness of her heart, is going to lend tremendous skill set to eight-year-olds in her local town or wherever she is to, to coaching, well, to get your first license, it's going to cost you a thousand bucks. Forget about to go all the way up. Just to, just to learn how to coach, to get to, to, to understand how to hone your skills and to teach kids, we're going to charge you a thousand bucks for the course and then you've got to get there and pay a hotel room. It is absolutely ridiculous. We have to, have to, have to lower the costs. And there are several ways to do it. And I talk about five in the context of pay to play, both for players and for coaches. You've got surplus that you can dip into that Eric was talking about. You've got grants that are available, and we need to invest and make sure that, that U.S. soccer is not leaving money on the table where grants are available for various programs that we run. You've got U.S. Soccer Foundation, which on the player side is already doing an excellent job of getting into inner cities, tapping into private, the private sector, and now even tapping into municipal funds. Municipal funds that are earmarked for infrastructure, they're saying, hey, give that to us, let's build a field. That's getting money, freeing up money that can go into coaching education and scholarships for players who need it. Tapping into the private market. You know, I, like I said, you know, my firm represents Bain and TPG, the biggest private equity firms in the world. These are firms that have $75 billion under management. We need to make sure we're going to the private sector and getting money that people would be happy to spend on good causes. The last thing that I would talk about in terms of raising this money to reduce the cost is solidarity payments. And I don't look at solidarity payments just as the actual payment to a club, which helps. But what I'm talking about is solidarity payments will incentivize clubs to go to funding sources that we don't have access to, local funding sources, a local diner that may want to contribute to a club, that may enable that club to pay for its coaches to get coaching, to take coaching courses. Those are types of that's those are the types of avenues we need to explore to get the cost down. The second thing that U.S. soccer needs to do, reduce the cost to get you know reduce the, to those those barriers, is for that young player coming out of college who wants to coach youth kids, or a parent who's older who wants to coach youth kids, needs to help out coaches with minimum standards. Again, not dictating, not telling hey you've got to play a four three three style of play or whatever it is at the, you know, with, with a, you know, a nine aside or eight aside. But minimum standards, coaching conduct, easily digestible things, fostering competition amongst kids. Ten seconds, Mike. Coaching conduct, health and nutrition, minimum tactical standards, so that our coaches not only can have a cheaper access to the coaching course, but have minimum standards that are being distributed to all coaches in an easily digestible way, state-of-the-art way, that they can at least understand some of the basic things that U.S. soccer expects. Thank you. <coughs> Michael? Uh, Kyle? Um, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of delegates recently who have highlighted that actually a lot of the coaching costs comes to them, and sometimes others are benefiting from it. So it, it, it's a problem they're actually trying to solve uh, and spending the money to do so. Uh, I've talked to many on the amateur level who have been involved in coaching, in coaching and, and actually refereeing, which is another area. You'll, you're going to see a trend here with the youth game, with coaching, with refereeing, that there's a major barrier to entry in terms of cost, right? So we look at the $150 million surplus, if that's what it actually is. Recently, it's been used as a report card, and, and Eric, I think, did a great job initially of saying, well, what happens when you, you, your product fails? Well, you, you point to profit, right? So the product is suffering right now. And what we're doing is saying, instead of finding a way to make it more affordable to get into the game, 
to stay in the game, to get a good coaching education. Steve mentioned the, the horror story of $12,000. One of the reasons that is, is I, I believe the A license is only in two locations, right? So we have this massive country. The B license is what, four locations? So that's how we're tackling the problem, is we're going to actually make it incredibly expensive in a crowded sports landscape to, to get a coaching education. The other thing we need to talk about is before you spend a penny on your coaching education, it has to start at home. That's one of the challenges with this soccer culture is we didn't grow up a lot of us with soccer parents. And we are the sort of first generation now of, in my household, the game's on all weekend. There's seven soccer balls around the house, and they have a coach at home. And I don't mean in a sort of strategy hovering over their kid all day long. I mean more of an, in a Tom Buyer sort of way of exciting your kid, exciting your kid about getting involved in the game, mastering the skill. I, I, I met with Tom recently when he's in New York before he jetted off to you know, Shanghai or another one of his demonstrations. And, and it's just fascinating that we're missing the biggest area, 26 million kids under that threshold where they get into the game of seven years old. And, and there's nothing that starts at that point. So before we get into, can we use the surplus to lower the cost of coaching? Absolutely we can. But go back to the Germany example, $2 billion thrown at the problem in a country the size of Oklahoma, $150 million surplus is not solving all these problems. So I think Michael brought up a great point. We have strategic partners, whether it's Coca-Cola or Nike or others who are already involved. There are private equity groups, and I'm sure Michael's met with a lot of them, I have too, that are willing to invest in growing this game and absolutely believe that you are gaining ground on the incumbents. You know, 20 million a night for NFL, but every parent out there is desperate to find a way to take a football out of their kids' hands because of these CTE reports, and we're not giving a compelling reason why coaching and soccer is a great avenue for a lot of the players that end up not continuing on in the pipeline. Ten, ten seconds, Kyle. One thing that I think is really important to illustrate, and Eric said this, and I, I absolutely agree, and I was just talking with Brian McBride about a, a we met in the lobby before this meeting. We talked about a, a teammate of mine, Edson Buttle. One of the greatest parts of my soccer education was the amateur game. His dad had an indoor game with Jamaicans in Old Greenwich. And one of the reasons I tried to do that with the ball and I tried to be a creative player with flair is because I paid $5 once a week to go in and get my butt kicked by the adults. And that's part of soccer education. So we absolutely can subsidize the cost of uh, educating our coaches. And Spain is a perfect example of a soccer community that's doing it perfectly. Paul? Well, I appreciate what U.S. Club Soccer is doing in, co in terms of coaching development. And there's a fine line between coaching development and coaching education. But certainly the, the one word that comes to my mind is interconnectedness. Of how we can utilize our resources, such as United Soccer Coaches. Um, how we could utilize uh, some of the initiatives that I'm proposing at the grassroots level with facility enhancements, with small courts, the extra day training that would be supervised versus trained, and of course the pass and receive at the initial stage you join soccer, those initiatives could also be interconnected with the lowering of cost for um, credentialing coaches. But certainly one thing I want to propose is that we look at our semi-pro or amateur leagues, the adult league, something that I believe that these players um, are vying or post-college or still have hopes to play soccer, but they are definitely soccer enthusiasts and fans and understand the game. And perhaps we could expedite a um, program where a weekend prior to their league and maybe a weekend post their league, that they could get credentials, adding thousands and thousands of more coaches that we can interject into our soccer system that understand and enjoy the game. Particularly that would help obviously the adult USA essay and uh, again it would be led by a national steering committee. It's just as important as we have uh, a youth development committee. We need to have a coaches development committee to guide these programs to interconnect what our resources are and to bring it fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <coughs> Sean? Yeah, so um, a couple of things that have come out. We've talked, Eric, you mentioned a couple times about the surplus. It's been there, $160 million. Um, why we have that much sitting there is is what it is. 
um, when there's lots of things that be could be corrected and one of the things that has been brought up here and that I think we as US club soccer are very passionate about is we know from just looking around the world that clubs are the answer clubs are what create players all over the world in every country South America Central America it's not the federations that are doing it. it's the clubs that are producing the players and our organization is passionate and is try to treat try to create a pathway to um, giving better resources and information of what is a club um, <clears throat> I'm getting to the question but I want to first make sure that we understand it in my opinion 90% um, of the clubs youth soccer clubs in our country they're not clubs Many of them are just organizations that share a jersey, right, and have some resources. They have different playing philosophies. In many cases, this coach has two teams, and off he goes, and he coaches his two teams one way. And not to say that there's one way to do it, but there needs to be a philosophy. There needs to be a vision uh, with each and every club. And getting people to understand that being part of a club is a cradle-to-grave sort of thing. And sure, at some point, you're going to have to hand off those top players to the DC United's, to the LA Galaxy, and that's all fine and good. But there's still a lot of players, especially prepubescent, that you're not. We're not going to know what they're going to be anyway. But we still need to be able to foster them into the adult ages and whatnot uh, of a club. And too often now we dismiss players at 18 after 10 years, and off they go to college, and there's never uh, a connection back to them. And those are your resources for future club administrators, coaches, referees. So now getting to the question part of it, our organization has been spending our money trying to do this without the support of the Federation. And if you're going to be the guy who is going to be in charge of that, whether it be the ID2 or whether it be the, um, <clears throat> the players' first campaign that we're doing, um, we, we are trying to do that. We have some fantastic models, leads within our organization, one I, I know actually quite well, that are, are doing it at a local level of coaching education, referee development, etc. But um, the too often, in my opinion, the U.S. soccer has created the, the winners and the losers, or the haves and the have not. And the professional clubs now, they have billion. They have billionaires. They have the money that they need. But it's all the other clubs that can really lift lift the boat of U.S. soccer and get more players into it. So if you or you or you had the $160 million, where would you see that? How would you? Would you have? And we're, we're a continent, and we have 12 TAs. Well, you could, hypothetically, you could say there should be 12 TAs in California alone to address the 500,000 unregistered players that you're talking about in L.A. County or San Diego, right? And we have 12 for a country, so... If you could just paint a picture of this, the allocation, or the areas that you see where we should put the greatest emphasis into those resources, one of which we just discussed, and that was coaching education. Uh, so who do you want to ask first? Uh, Steve. Mr. Gans, since yeah. you're Okay, up. Steve? <laughs> sure. I, I, are you, if you could clarify just for a minute, are you, are you talking about how I, how we'd use a surplus on a whole, or you are you specifically focusing on coaching or that sort of thing? Is it the broad question? Yeah, absolutely. If you're the if you're our president and we're U.S. Club Soccer, we sure. support clubs and developing clubs because we believe clubs yep. are the vehicle to success in our country, right. not just with our national teams but our professional teams, and with a lifetime of football, our the next fans that we have, the next administrators. So are you going to give U.S. Club Soccer that $160 million? <laughs> uh, how can I finesse that? The answer is no. <laughs> but but what, what I would say is, is you know, and let's, let's talk not about the surplus for a minute, but let's talk about something uh, you touched on, which is sort of the dichotomy between the MLS-run development academy clubs and the non-MLS development academy clubs and other clubs, uh, uh, very important clubs. And so, you know, the, the solidarity payment issue is something that is glaring uh, and up front and out front right now. And it's, it's absolutely, and even in the last month or so, ha has hit critical mass. And, you know, I come from a non 
uh, MLS Development Academy Club, and I'm very sympathetic to those to those arguments. I'm not a soundbite guy, right? So I'm not going to say yes solidarity payments because you know we're aware of the intricacies and the legal issues and all that sort of thing. What I do believe with respect to solidarity is that it is ideally the right thing to do, and I think all parties should should get together and solve this presumptively, and then find the legal mechanism to make sure that it is enforceable. So even the attorney who's leading the case on this matter, Lance Reich, doesn't come out, I believe, I don't want to speak for Lance, and just say, yes, what he says is that we, would, we should try to develop a system that is reminiscent, uh, mimics to the extent it can the system that works around the world, right? I believe MOS wants to uh, solve this problem. I think the Federation is another example of your institutional arrogance or lack of attention until it becomes a huge issue. How much litigation does the Federation face uh, or quasi-litigation? Why did we wind up on 60 Minutes for the, the women's issue? It was because of either dismissiveness or lack of dealing with a really important issue up front. So first of all, one of the issues is pay-to-play should be addressed. Solidarity payments should help these clubs. The Crossfire case in particular is a stark example of why these, these, these clubs who are under U.S. clubs, auspices, and other clubs should be treated more fairly. So absolutely part of my platform of that surplus will go back. We, we talked about this horrible inverse relationship, greatest surplus, worst result. So it goes back to additional programming at the youth level, also to the adult level, uh, for field development for kids and otherwise provide scholarships for youth players who otherwise can't afford, and, and to increase diversity and inclusion. So in the grand sense, for sure, these clubs need to be supported. We need to get kids. You know, I know I, I didn't sit on the, uh, on the scholarship committee of my, of, of my board, but I know we have partnerships with inner city clubs, and not every single kid who is good enough to play got a scholarship. And that's achingly sad, achingly sad, because every kid – should be able to play. So in that sense, that money, yes, it goes back to support the good efforts of, of those clubs, for sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. Uh, Paul? Yeah, in all due respect, Sean, uh, to focus on uh, specifically U.S. club soccer and the initiative of how those funds could assist with some visions that U.S. club soccer has, um, I'd like to first preface it by looking at regional and national training centers programs. And that would focus on, in certain areas, 22 to 66 players um, based on if there's three age groups depending on the demographics and population, uh, both um, boys and girls and at ages of 16, under 16 and under 18. That kind of program would have to fa fall under an Olympic developmental program, thus the ID2 program giving us flexibilities and breaking down barriers that we're faced today. With that said, um, again, it would be more of a reform for United States Soccer Developmental Academy because there's going to be a transitional period to go through, and that would have to take the minds to be to look at how the umbrella that organization or the parts of it or infrastructure that is meaningful to put under the Olympic Developmental Program. With that said, I could visualize a club um, having a player selected into those national or regional training centers uh, be, be um, compensated for the, the fee-based loss. So, for instance, if there's a club under the U.S. Soccer Club organization that sends a player to a regional training center, that that club should be compensated a fair value. Let's for sake of conversation, say it's a roughly $2,500 for that player's fee. So that club or team could go back and maybe scholarship somebody else or find a replacement for that player. If that player is dismissed from the training center for whatever reasons, they should be able to have an opportunity, he or she, to go back to their club, back to their team. So having those funds would be uh, allowing a place to, for that player to return. If the player is selected to move on after a year, then um, that club could receive additional compensation for that loss or holding that position, etc. So 
it would be incentive-based programs that would um, attract players to those clubs based on the development of the coach. A coach at any level, college, professional, professional, you're based on merit. And we, we talk about the merit-based system. Um, that would attract players to go play for that coach, that organization that is moving players on to those training centers. In addition to that, I would look at um, the experts in youth soccer to really move into the urban areas to look at how to provide this club platform in areas that we haven't focused. And I would, again, look at it to be interconnected maybe with small courts or other initiatives that um, would be in place, such as futsal, to utilize the expertise, such as the um, technical directors, directors, and coaches of U.S. club soccer and the such to accomplish those tasks. So it would be a two-fold program. One is to look at what the organization does well, and it continues to do well, and that's the expertise, is building this club environment and support it um, from the voice of what they believe their, their needs are, be it through a current program they have or a, a new developing program, um, also to create an incentive-based program seconds. for these clubs to be compensated, and of course to use their expertise going into the urban areas. Um, before we move on to Eric, Steve just asked if he could add something. So, Steve, I'll give you 30 seconds. Thanks, Kevin. It's just a short one because I, I did realize in the question you, you, you did raise, Sean, the, uh, the, the, the players first initiative that you started. And, and, you know, so I know it was a tongue in a cheek question about whether all $160 million, uh, was going to U.S. club soccer, but those ty type of progressive initiatives, and I don't know enough about Players First yet, but I've read a bit about player health and safety part of it and parent engagement and education. And those types of things which are progressive and which advance the game, those are the types of things, again, if done on the merits, yes, there could be support of something like that in those programs to spread them because we know we have issues in both those areas in particular. Um, so all tongue-in-cheek aside, yes, potentially part of that does go at least indirectly the U.S. club soccer. So I just want to clarify that. Thanks, Kevin. Eric? Look, I've, I've argued this point, um, maybe at the professional level, that this country has never engaged in the real business of soccer. And it is impossible for us to even talk about a solidarity payment until we celebrate the idea of what clubs are and what they should be. Uh, if you think it's 90%, I think that's a, a little bit high. But um, to, for the Canadians in the room, there's this... If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. I think Rush might have been. Yeah. I don't know if Neil Peart said that or Getty Lee. It doesn't matter. But the Getty. truth is, the truth is, is that if we're going to talk about what soccer is and what it should be through the clubs, our federation has done very little to encourage club soccer. They've tried to essentially not celebrate it. They tried to steal it. That is what is going on. And if nobody wants to, to admit that, then they're just delusional or not paying attention. Now, as far as the, the, the money is concerned, the realities of what solidarity payment is, is when kids have a, a, a connection, not just to the game, but to their club, then they want to stay. And then they want to come back and work for you. That's what a club is. I mean, of course, if you, if you were to go through some of the better players that we've seen in the world, whether that be Germany or England, it doesn't matter. They started somewhere. They started at Rot Weiss Essen, or they started at... Sandhausen, or they started somewhere because they had a club that took care of them. They had a club that understood what their function was. Now, until the Federation recognizes that as the single best potential that we have as a soccer nation, we are going to continue to stagnate. It's the bottom line. And if it is about the money, it really is. If there is incentivizing this, is part of what a club should do. You put a lot of money, a lot of effort into this to create an environment that people can grow and get better. You know, it, it, there are kids that they play for a coach that has two coaches and then they go play for one shirt and the other shirt and they have they, they don't they don't even know what game they're in. They don't even know. When you have a, a different setup, it goes back to the culture of where we're getting this wrong as a country. When we start redefining our culture, we will start producing players. So just before I get to the next one and good points, but do you feel that it is the business or in the best interest of the Federation to be running these programs or no, I'd say, outsource it to an organization that has soccer professionals I've said who this have before. played, administered, 
and whatnot. Stay out of your way. That's what the Federation Thank needs you. to do. Okay. Get out of your business. It's your business. Right. And I <clears throat> would argue that club soccer, when it's addressed appropriately, whether that be anywhere in the world, and we should take a little bit of a historical perspective here. The rest of the world does do things a little differently than we do it. And that's why they're beating us. So let's reassess what we are, start figuring out a way to invest in what we have, and maybe we can become the soccer nation we're expecting to be. But not until we change that culture. And I think you're right. I think that is, that is the vehicle. But we have to trust ourselves, and we have to have a federation that is understanding their role in this process. Right now, it's... it's, it's uh, what did I say? I said they don't celebrate, they steal it. And that, that's what's happening. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Michael? <clears throat> so, Sean, I want to start with what you finished with, 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 the, with the comment about outsourcing. I don't look at it as outsourcing. I wouldn't even use that word because outsourcing implies that it's my business to give to somebody. It's not. Good U.S. Point. soccer should allow businesses to compete. The United States has done that, and that's why we are who we are today. It needs to, as Eric said, get out of the way when private businesses compete. It needs to create an even playing field for those businesses. It needs to express a vision and minimum standards that it expects in players and coaches and parents and, and the consumer. But it needs to let the private businesses compete because when private businesses compete, they do a much better job than regulatory bodies. When you talked about the club, I just played in my in my high school or you know, high school slash club alumni game that's been going on in Rockville Center, Long Island since I think 1960 something. My son is not going to have that, and the reason my son's not going to have that is there isn't yet the, somewhere along the line the loyalty to club has ceased. And by the way, it's not a soccer problem, right? This happens everywhere across society these days. Everybody's a free agent. The parents are their agents. The kids are free agents, and there's no sense of loyalty. How do you change that? It's, it's easy to identify that problem. It's a very difficult thing to change because you need to change a culture. And U.S. soccer's role needs to be the following. U.S. soccer, and I've said this before, in structuring things needs to go state by state. Where somebody like U.S. club soccer is doing it right, we need to get your message out. We need to, to say, look, this is an example of how we think it needs to get done. You should follow their example. If you don't follow their example, we're going to create clarity. Because right now, one of the problems is in this market, there's no clarity for the consumer. That's a conglomerate of so many competing and overlapping businesses. You look at parents, coaches, players, they don't even know which product is for what. We need clarity. And then ultimately, what's going to wind up happening is the consumer is going to say, you know, there's something special going on with these teams. Oh, that's U.S. club soccer. These kids seem to be loyal. They're staying with their club. Something good is happening there and that product winds up getting more of a business. But you need clarity for the consumer to allow that to happen. Uh, in terms of the money and where I would spend it in this respect, I've said from the beginning that I think, again, on a state-by-state -state basis, that we need to have state soccer centers. Something visible, U.S. soccer <coughs> visible in each state, a soccer center with a soccer director who is paid a competitive salary. We want folks, instead of coaching at Duke University and having a great career to say, you know what, it is just as viable for me to get this job as state soccer director. Get talented people in charge of training, identifying players and training them. And how do they do that? By working with U.S. Club, by working with the other leagues to say, what is the best structure in this state and how can I make sure that I'm identifying talent regardless of where they are? Right? U.S. soccer should not be in the business of, I'm going to go to the academies Tell each of the academy coaches in my neighborhood, give me your five best players, and there's my, you know, what used to be an ODP state team. Or an ID Ten seconds, Mike. <clears throat> you need to be in the business of identifying players, regardless of where they are in that state. Bringing them into a state soccer center with two fields and an identity and training them, and those are for the elite players on that elite path, path to the national team. Again, it needs to be state by state, and it needs to involve and celebrate the successes of, of organizations like U.S. Club Soccer and use them as examples. Cool. Kyle? Quick, I'm sorry. May I'm do sorry. a quick follow-up with that? Clarity, yeah. I love that word. I love that you used it. Mm -hmm. So to clarify for the parents the crazy landscape that it is, do you feel that we should drop all of these acronyms of, you know, ODP, ECNL, EPL, NPL, 
and just have a football structure that is based on merit oh. as opposed to golden tickets that we're handing out to certain people based upon perhaps uh, a relationship or perhaps because they have money, right? Shouldn't we do away with this entitlement of yeah. your club is good and yours isn't, and just let like let the ship rise? You got a club. Yeah. You, you got a club. <laughs> you know, this is and well. That's and what let, happened let me, with the. That's how the DA performed. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me eat into my next question to answer this. But the the you know I have said from the beginning in one of my pillars, which is the inclusive, merit based, and transparent. You, you, th there are there are when you have businesses competing. Mm -hmm. And, and so let, let's not forget that when we were growing up, soccer was very different. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a billion, multi-billion dollar a year enterprise now, still run in many respects by volunteers who are just, you know, sort of helping out on the weekends. We need, we, you need to make sure that people have the right interests at heart, qualifications, you need things to be merit-based. When you talk about getting rid of all the acronyms, let me just break that down into two different areas. You've got the acronyms on the... ID2, ODP, US Training Center side, kids that are you know, hoping to be the next Eric Ronaldo. And you've got the other acronyms on the other side, whether it's ASO, US Soccer, US Club, and a whole bunch of others, for kids that are in it, maybe not gonna be aspiring to the national team, but in it for the right reasons to play soccer. Figuring out whether to get rid of those acronyms on the 99.9% on the .9 side is, I, I think that's, again, that goes back to my state-by-state -state basis. You may wind up in a state, but what's going to work in Northern California is not going to be the same thing that's going to work in New Mexico, in Maine, in Virginia. You need to go on a state-by-state -state basis. And, and you may go to a state and they say, listen, everything works perfectly here. ASO's rec, U.S. Youth Soccer is after that, U.S. Club's above them, we've got Academy above them, everybody's happy, working perfectly. There's no need to get rid of acronyms if everything's working perfectly. Right? I don't think, you know, we don't need to burn it down for no reason. Where you have competition and overlap, then we need to figure out, do we get rid of acronyms or private businesses? We can only do so much with them, right? We can't just push them out of business. Can we at least encourage them to reorganize hierarchically by region in a way that's in the best interest of soccer and the kids? Sometimes it's getting rid of acronyms. Sometimes it's not. Same thing on the other side. I'm going to finish in just a quick second. Same thing on the, on the elite side as well. On the elite side... It may be that ultimately you need a clear path to the national team. And I think it should be the state soccer center. It may be that you keep ID2 as a way of, hey, let's go to ID2. Who have you guys got? Who have you guys got? It may be that you get rid of all of that and put it in the state soccer center. Either way, that state director is working with U.S. Club and all the other leagues to make sure that it is canvassing the entirety of the landscape to make sure we're getting the, great, the right players and bringing them in to train at the soccer center. Hey, just for the record, I never made my district team at the age of 16, so... Yeah. Well, that. You, <coughs> that was for off-the-field reasons. <laughs> so, Sean, was your question based only on the elite players of the small percentage we're talking about, or was it based on the grassroots level as well? As far as my, my initial yeah, question, or the follow-up? I think the follow-up. Follow um, I took it as both. I sort of talked about the grassroots and the, the elite. Yeah, no, I, I mean, again, it, it's just to getting to the club-centric yeah. and what our organization, we are about clubs, trying to get people to understand, identify, and what? foster the growth of what a club is because truly people don't get it. People don't understand why because maybe they've never been outside this country. Three of us here were fortunate to live in a country um, and play in a country that has 28,000 soccer clubs, 28,000. And we have people in Northern California clamoring that because we have 225, we have too many clubs and we've diluted the product. They have 28,000, but every club has the possibility of playing whatever level they choose to achieve mm -hmm. based upon their philosophy, their vision, or the relationships with, that they might have with the big club in town or merit. So I think Sean's point is that it, this, it should be merit-based. There may be other ways that you organize things like geography, but it shouldn't be an entitlement program. <clears throat> right, and I, I was looking at it from the different levels or layers that we see from recreational, competitive, or elite. And um, so you could take it at the grassroots level, would be more of the recreational side, enjoy. But there's athletes and players that play this game that just want to keep it to that level all the way through their soccer careers. And um, 
you know, competitive, maybe defined as competitive to enjoy it and play through high school and it's over, or competitive want to get to college level, and then of course elite. Well, we're talking about these, you know, regional, national, state training centers. It's a small percentage that we're looking at to really um, narrow focus and get further um, to the national team program. So that's why I was asking that. So question. let's get let's get back on track. I think Kyle, it's your turn. So I'll go back to the surplus question that they started with initially, Sean. Um, How much you give us? <laughs> How much you give us? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I don't have the credit card yet. Um, so. Listen, follow the money, right? That's what they say. And, and I look at the surplus as opportunity cost. I, I see fields not being built. I see coaching, education is not being subsidized. I see the game not being subsidized. But um, Mike highlighted a, a, a good point. 150 doesn't put a dent in, in the problem that we have and what we need to do. So it's about getting strategic partners to pony up and help to do that. And, and if you go and scrape through the budget that, that, that they show at the AGM every year, and I've done it and I've had my team do it for the last three years, they'll tell you what they prioritize. Go look through it and there is almost no money spent on the bottom of the pyramid. I mean, you can, you can look at how they see coaching. I mean, $3 million <coughs> for a national team coach. I mean, let's not even get into the disparity between that and what they're paying the women's national team coach, which is a, another issue, but an equally important one. Uh, they're focusing on the top of the pyramid and spending a lot of the budget on that. Um, th th that's where we need to have a bit more transparency. And, and the, the Development Academy is one area where we kind of initially started with this, where... I said sometimes it's a meritocracy based on results and not performance, and, and we have to try and get away from um, parents being either confused or convinced that there, whether it's by points or other metrics, that there is a club that their kid has to be in in order to make it the track. But what we have to get away from is, to, is this continuation of the narrative that we're talking about elite soccer. That is absolutely an important part of this pyramid and what we need to focus on, but you said it. The majority of the people that are going to get into the system, we lose a lot of them to other sports and we need to address that, but these are our future fans. This is our future soccer culture. So if we're gearing the system towards the elite level, we're losing a lot of these kids. We're losing a lot of these future fans who are going to be our referees, our coaches, our administrators, our executives at companies that are going to give us a lot of money to continue to grow this thing. So. I think of the club culture, and I still have a wonderful relationship with my club, and I go back and coach Beachside regularly. I go to their banquets and enjoy being tied into that, and it worries me that we've lost that a bit. But we have to look at a couple of the areas we've talked about, right? Why is there infighting, and why has the youth level become so tribal? The creation of U.S. club soccer was not born out of a desire to be competitive. It was born out of a need that you felt wasn't being served. and. We have to understand that every group has value. Every group is developing different types of players at different points in their career, but we're all together trying to grow the game. 30 seconds. But when U.S. <clears throat> Soccer creates the Development Academy, it, it, it makes it more competitive because now instead of incentivizing you to pass players in certain directions, you worry that now you're trying to grab and hold on to your market share. And if it's true that they've applied for a patent for DA2, and they're actually trying to build their backyard further into what I think is an important property to grow this game, then that concerns me because that's not what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on building this culture from the ground up. And solidarity payments, it's a buzzword that we keep using. And you said it, Mike, uh, intentionally, it wasn't accidental. Grants, that's the word. We can solve that right away. The labor laws, how do you get around that? And, and Christian, by the way, I know you came in recently. How are you? Um, Kyle, let me, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you a second because I actually want to address what you're about to raise, I wanted to just address it as a specific question, if you don't mind. And I'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, follow up on, because several of you have mentioned the issue of solidarity payments. That was actually going to be the next question we asked. It was actually a question both Mike Sweeney voiced it, but also Tim Schultz, who is the president of uh, <coughs> Rush Soccer, um, sent in a, a question asking. So I want to ask each of you, beginning with Kyle, if you, in a minute, just tell us what your position is on the question of compensating clubs for developing players, and should that be statutory, as it is in some countries and as it is in the FIFA rules, or should it be something along the lines of what you were just, the path you were just going down, Kyle? So, um, do you want to tackle that 
first? Or had I run out of time and this is the next Well, you had <laughs> kind of run out of time. <laughs> and you, but you were I starting to get that. into this. Yeah, so. So, so, TV. So, yeah. I don't have a producer in my ear telling me to wrap. Um, solidarity payments. Uh, the reason I point to grants is because, um, you know, I, I, I'll go back to that conversation where the South Carolina uh, Association and Hans and his team brought this up. Now they're growing membership is by focusing at the rec level, 150% increase on focusing at the entry level of the game. Now, how we get rid of some of the infighting is to make sure everyone understands that they absolutely have a role in a space in this game. And as we grow the pie, there are more kids coming up. Now, how you incentivize clubs to pass someone to a quote-unquote better academy and forget that we, we have to first identify and educate parents that that actually is a better opportunity for your kid. How we scout, that's another issue, is basically being astronomers that don't move the telescope much. Um, we can create solidarity payment situations in the form of grants by giving clubs that pass kids to a, if they're an elite player, to a more elite academy give them grants that make it easier for them to lower costs to bring three more kids into their structure. And that becomes an annuity that incentivizes you to develop kids the right way, but also not be so concerned with hanging on to them. Listen, maybe staying at your club is the absolute right thing for them and the right thing for a lot of kids. But as we grow it from the bottom up, you shouldn't have a worry that you're sending a kid to a competitor. There should be a financial incentive for you to do so if it's the right thing for that player. I dealt with it at the college level, and I'm sure you can say this too. You know, George Gellerman had to make tough decisions. Do I send players into the pros, or do, do I try to keep on to them? Um, I really think we can accomplish this. It's one area that we're getting a bit confused by calling it solidarity payments. And, you know, the, the Crossfire one is one of about two dozen uh, cases that have been brought forward that will create a bit of a precedent. Um, but I, I really want us, you know, Tim Bush, for instance, who's the Adult um, Association in Washington, you got a 30000 grant to create walking soccer for uh, senior players. They can do that. U.S. soccer is giving grants all, all over the place, but we have to make sure it's not PR. Not, not all actually, over the place. Well, not, well, <laughs> that's my point. Is that sometimes it's just PR, and that's not, that's not really making a dent, kind of like the task force where you click on diversity and it goes to a blank page. There's a couple of these things that I think are disingenuous. We can do the same thing they did with Tim Bush with solidarity payments to make sure that clubs have an, have an incentive to grow players the right way and pass them if that's the right thing to do. Um, so that same question, I'll just ask each of you to try to answer it in a minute. Um, Steve, I'll call on you next. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to quickly address the, the grant idea and, and the corporate sponsorship idea, which I really want to get sophisticated answers and I don't want, I don't want to be a sound bite guy. I absolutely think these are great uh, ideas, but I think when the rubber hits the road, we have to have a practical reality. In New Hampshire, there's a club that you guys all know called Seacoast, and they have 50 corporate sponsorships, 50, because they have New Hampshire, by and large. In the greater Boston area, most of the leading clubs have zero corporate sponsors, or they have one. And there is a reality here, and there's a juxtaposition between what parents and even companies believe right, in a pay-to-play model about whether their grant should go there. So I just want to state the sophisticated answer that there is a, 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 a barrier of knowledge and presumption, presumptive knowledge that needs to be overcome in that regard. So I don't think that that per se is the easy answer. In terms of solidarity, I, I absolutely uh, feel that this is something we should move to, move to for all the right reasons to defray pay-to-play to encourage clubs to focus on player development for fairness's sake. All interested parties should meet and try to design a system that does mimic the system that works in the rest of the world. Now, when you ask whether or not it should be statutory, that is, at this point, very unclear because we face unique issues in this country, right? And so this has to be modeled, and it has to test the legal, the legal strictures, but I'm confident that the parties get together and come up with a presumptive solution to this and a fair solution that this can be uh, dealt with, the legal issues can be dealt with, and it may be a unique model. Um, too early to say whether it should be statutory. But I do think it's a problem that's ever-present at the forefront and needs to be solved for the good of the game and for the fairness to those clubs who are not MLS Development Academy clubs. And by the way, I believe MLS wants to solve this problem. Uh, Paul? Paul? <clears throat> 
When a, a player goes from a club to a DA club, maybe out of ID2 program into a DA club, eventually moves on, um, I don't see in Major League Soccer or USL that there's payments that could be made um, from that level. But if they move on to international play, uh, it seems, or from my knowledge, these uh, clubs do like to pay, and they w are willing to play. And I don't believe that it's U.S. Soccer Federation's right to deny that opportunity for a club to compensate some other club. But if you look at the, the spider web or connect the dots, it becomes super complicated. And, I, and I, I, I do believe at what stage do you say who developed? And it goes back to how do we define this word development rather than just using it for a gaming circuit and say so that's what we're developing for. But development, that is the, the purpose for this solidarity payment, and it works, and it works in a lot of clubs throughout the world. Christian Pulisic will get a, a fee, and he will go to his club, and um, they'll build a facility out of it. So uh, does is anyone mandating Dortmund to do it? No. <coughs> Are they going to do it out of the, the, a gift, perhaps? And it's going to happen. So certainly it's a, it's a topic that's reasonable. It's uh, practical to discuss, and it does need to be um, figured out in terms of <clears throat> if we have all these connecting dots with multiple organizations or teams that are going to claim this player for a fee, it makes it complicated and it has to be brought together to a committee and minds to be to solve that. Michael? <clears throat> the complication, I think, falls by a little bit by the wayside that Paul's talking about, which he's right about, when you start getting clubs into the culture and develop loyalty and create clarity in the structure, you wind up having a lot less of those dots. People are jumping around a lot less. To answer the question, yes, we should have solidarity payments. Yes, it should be statutory. I don't believe any of this nonsense about you know complications in the U.S. and antitrust laws. There is absolutely a way to sort this out and solve it. There are two reasons that we need to do it. MLS already does it. When MLS, when the Red Bulls sell a player, they get money for that player. That money gets kicked back to their youth program, and it gives them an uneven <coughs> advantage against other teams that don't have that revenue source. So when another team gets it right and sells it to a player, to a professional club, that club should also benefit on the upside, uh, from the financial <coughs> upside. Um, and and, and the, not only is it that, I, I, I want to say this again, I said it before, it's not just that one payment. When you create an, a, a solidarity payment system, you incentivize upfront payments, uh, upfront investments. Clubs can say, you know what? I'm going to invest in my club. I'm going to invest in my coaches. I'm going to invest in my players because I know if I wind up developing a Christian Pulisic, like I'm telling everybody I will, I'm going to get a really big payday. I'm going to get all of it back plus some. Not everybody will get that payback because not everybody's going to become the next Pulisic, but it's going to incentivize all of those clubs to invest their own money, to go into the local community and invest that money and get that money as well. Ten seconds. Could I steal his answer? That yes. Because I, I like <laughs> it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, incentivizing is, is a huge uh, proponent of this. I, mean, I am a proponent of that. But I think looking at, at this, and we've all done a pretty good job of answering the question. But yes, yes, and yes, I'm with him on that. Okay. <clears throat> well, Eric, you played for Bolkman. They're one of the leaders in developing youth players in yeah. Germany. And, they, and then you have guys like Gundogan who went straight to, to Dortmund. And they paid for him. But he was a player that, you know, the other problem that you have in Germany is, is now you have younger players. And we're seeing this with guys like Weston McKinney and Sargent and some of our younger players. And that you look at Germany, they're looking at us and saying, wow, look at the talent that they have. How do we tap into that? Uh, that our country needs to understand the opportunity within and, and have a better understanding of it through our clubs that we can, uh, let's face it, capitalize on. Well, and, and I'm on the, uh, the ownership uh group of Real Mallorca, and we developed a player Asensio who's doing pretty decently at Real Madrid right now, and you better believe we're watching every weekend waiting for <laughs> him to score enough goals to be sold, because that immediately builds facilities for our group, and we don't have the money yet, we absolutely have itemized where we're going to put that money, uh, so if anyone knows an agent, it's going to be sold. Here. I have two players that play at Vanguard University in Costa Mesa, California, where most people want to know. And they're fresh, they're sophomores, and they're going to be invited to Club America. That's great. So Club America's asking, who do we pick? Yeah. Yeah. And well, the money comes difficult. in, it just doesn't go. They, 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 so, want to, <laughs> they want to compensate. So staying on the, um, on kind of the general, some of the general questions around the, the DA and the structure of the DA and how it operates and so forth, 
We have questions from uh, both uh, Yvonne Fuchs of the Hotspur Soccer Club in Pittsburgh and John Parker, who is a parent at Maryland United. And they're both asking uh, each of each of the candidates what their opinion is regarding the value of high school soccer in today's development of players in the game. And in that context, would you ease the restrictions on participating in high school sports um, within the development academy? So I'll ask Kyle first. Kyle's the closest to high school. <laughs> but why am I going to go with gray hair? I'm not making any accusations here, but I do look the oldest. <laughs> Well, I, I would just love to answer this one, but I'm, that's not why we're here. So <laughs> I'll give you a minute of my time. You take the first minute of my time. So listen, I, I, some of my greatest soccer memories are high school memories. I played with my brother. We made it to a state final. We lost to Guilford. My brother was a goalie, so we've forgiven each other for the goal he, he let up in overtime. But um, this kind of feels like going back to where we started with PDI and the, and the, and the birth chart, right? We're trying to build a soccer culture. You know what felt like a soccer culture? Playing in front of my schoolmates, everyone up on the hill. Christy <coughs> Lilly Field, that was when you made it to the district finals, under the lights. And one of the greatest moments when I grew up was being a part of that group. That was a soccer culture, not because of what it gave me as a player and, and that club culture that you said, Sean, that's kind of leaving. Well, that's leaving high school as well. And kids are kind of being forced to make a decision to leave something that's really integral in their Development, sure, for some late bloomers, high school is still a very good level. The more we take good players out, the less it's a great level for everyone. But as fans, not the people on the field, but the people watching. So I still, I just went back to my high school alumni game, uh, Thanksgiving. We had 200 people turn out. We actually had to play like 20 on 20 because there wasn't enough field space for everyone. And I, I, one of my pictures in my phone that I use with my screensaver is my brother and I playing for the high school team. Now, I left to go down to Boletary my junior year of high school, and the residency program that we, do, that we did away with is actually a great program. It's kind of like you throw a shot glass of water and it doesn't put the fire out, so you stop. Um, I grew so much as a player down in Florida, and I made that decision for myself, and I was fortunate my parents could afford to, to send me to something like that. Uh, but I came back my senior year. As good as it was for me, as much as I grew as a player down there, I, I missed being a part of playing against Fairfield in Connecticut, one of our rivals, and, and being a part of something that's special. <coughs> High school, rec, uh, travel, ODP, uh, the, the, you know, the development academy. And that's, that kind of goes back to we need to start to push the narrative that every single level is important in growing players, but more importantly, growing the soccer culture. So forcing kids to decide between high school and club, forcing kids to, to leave a team because of the day they were born and they don't get to play with their buddies anymore. I mean, these are decisions that are made again from the apartment, I think that's, that's what Eric said, that, that if you asked all the experts, they'd say high school absolutely has something to bring to the game. It has its place in the soccer culture. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to, to take things like that away, to, to manipulate the system, to make it look like a country we look nothing like. Uh, Kyle, let me ask you a follow-up, and then everybody can incorporate this <coughs> as well. How, do, how should that decision be made? Uh, who should make the decision on a policy like that, for instance? In this instance, it, you, you could argue that that, po that decision was made by staff mm -hmm. at U.S. Soccer, and it was ratified as part of a whole mass of, of uh, proposals that were presented to the Board of Directors. So also address, in the course of addressing this issue, and I'll give you another 30 seconds, Kyle, okay. address the process. <clears throat> so just like I said about the PDI, um, Decisions like that should be made around tables like this, and there should be discourse before a decision like, like that is made. So we go to the people on the ground who are the actual experts in this category say, how will this decision impact your game? How will the, um, you know, the, build, the build out from the back line affect the game? Is that a positive? Is that a bad decision? How will shrinking the size of the field impact the game at your level? Um, the makeup of this board, Sean, and you said it, you know, the makeup of this board, if U.S. soccer's board was more representative of what this board looks like and, and other boards look like, then I think we wouldn't have the soccer blind spot we have currently. We wouldn't be making decisions um, in a unilateral way that so drastically affect the soccer landscape. So I, I think decisions like this absolutely should not be happening at the soccer house. Decisions should be happening at this level in terms of discourse to get us close to a binary situation of where we go with this. 
and then you can take it back to a great athletes council, a, a, a great uh, part of the board who can look at situations like this. But you know, again, I'm fearful. There's a meeting going on uh, in, in, in a few, a week or two with the board where they're again going to make decisions that drastically impact the landscape, and they're going to do it without any of our input. And things like that really worry me, that we need to really be pointing out that this board that fell asleep at the wheel with a lot of the things that happened over the last two decades, let's give credit to Dan Flynn and others that have helped grow this business in a big way, but we're kidding ourselves if we're going to take a president right now and make it a more peripheral figure, part-time chairman of the board, and all of a sudden, that's going to solve a lot of problems. No, what we need is a president that will sit in this seat and say, I'm not the expert, please help me go back to our group and tell them what we should be doing. And then we're going to make a decision, but I promise you we're going to check with you before you get that memo. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Michael? <clears throat> Forcing kids to give up high school is ridiculous. You don't need the rule. It's going to be self-selecting anyway. right? The kids who are on target to play at Duke or UVA or any of the other top programs are going to, if, if they decide that their high school program is not good enough, he or she's not going to go to the high school program. It's going to be simple. It's going to be self-selected. You don't need to force it. The decision, again, like Kyle was saying, it goes back to how these decisions are made. And I'll, I'll take a less cynical approach. I like to think that there was good faith behind the decision. Somebody sat down, as many, as a, as a, many of us have said, and thought to ourselves, now listen, how do I get this right? I want to take these kids, I want to get them in an environment where they're competing at a high level and learning for an extended period of time. But if I take three or four months out of that, and I drop them in a high school where I don't know the co in my town for many years the high school coach was the wrestler, the high school soccer coach was the wrestling coach who was a math teacher and decided to pick up soccer on the side. And I'm talking about up until about two years ago, not not in like the 1970s. And so I get the the concern. You're going to wind up with a guy who doesn't know the game, or a coach who doesn't know the game, and you're going to wind up with players who are constrained by your 20,000 person town. Who knows what kind of talents there? So. I get all that, and I, and I understand the thinking, but I have to think again, same thing that Kyle was saying. If you brought people around the table who are actually involved and you're going to be impacted by this, people would say you don't need to do this. Yeah. You don't need f to force kids to give up what is one of the <coughs> greatest social experiences of their lives, many of whom will remember high school even more than college soccer, with their high school friends and their high school teams and wearing a letterman's jacket in the hallways. You can't force them to give it up. The kids who don't belong there will probably self-select out of it anyway. And the last thing I'd say about this is, agree with Kyle, right? We're going to get around the table. I don't want to give a false sense of kumbaya. It's not easy, right? When you've got folks from academy, let's assume everybody's got the best interests at heart. You've got folks from the academy. You've got high school coaches. You've got youth coaches. You maybe have pro coaches, college coaches. They, each of those factions may have different interests and different thoughts. It's hard work getting people to understand why a unified path is better than fracturing. And it's not an easy job. If it were, I'd be out of work. But you've got to bring people together, get them around the table, have that conversation, and forge forward in a sensible way. Steve? Oh. Okay, there was a delay. So I lived the academy seven years, as a, a five and a half years as a board member and seven years as a parent. And let me give the federation credit where they're right, okay? And again, I always want to give as sophisticated an, an answer as possible and nothing knee-jerk. So here's where they're right. In a general sense, the coaching, competition, and training in the academy is superior to high school in a general sense, in most cases. There's no question they're right about that. And I understand the reason behind it. That said, there's something really terribly wrong with the academy. I lived it every couple of months, every season, every half year, new rules, new strictures at getting the kids to be more focused on or more like a pro, whatever that means. We know what that means, but how they interpolate how a new rule is going to solve that and promote that is, is utterly ridiculous. So... With respect to high school, you know, my view on the academy is we're going to revamp it, not eliminate it, revamp it, and liberalize those rules on high school. Absolutely liberalize those rules on high school. Does it mean that uh, kids, some kids will choose not to play high school? 
That's correct. Some will choose not to play high school. But the issue with respect to the academy is that they aim to create pro-like settings, and they don't. A typical academy game is like a test tube. It's 40 white-knuckled parents holding on to the fence and not cheering for their kids because they're, they're, they're so stressed. If it's the fall, there are no college coaches there, so it's one USSF observer. And the kids play in a test tube, and the kids are technically good, but there's no pizzazz in the game at all. And the kids don't learn how to play in front of a crowd. My son originally committed to another school, D1 school, and to that school's credit, when he was getting burnt out in the academy, and we asked whether he could play a year of high school, the school said yes, which doesn't usually happen, by the way, once you commit. And, and my son got his joy back. I mean, he'd never be the player he is, honestly, if, if he hadn't played in the academy, uh, technically. But he got his joy back, and the way he's playing right now as a freshman, from playing at Newton South High School, which is comparatively very, very inferior to the academy, and, and for another club, uh, because that school wouldn't let him play for the second team in the, in the development academy club. And so the reality is, what's wrong with this? He also learned to play in front of 500, 500 people or 1,000 people. That's more pro-like. Those are conditions that are more pro-like. So the reality is those decisions are being made at 30,000 square feet by those who are attenuated, and they don't, in large sense, know what they're doing. So when you ask Kevin, I believe it was you, Kevin, who asked, who makes that decision? Well, I agree with Kyle. Athletes Council would have input. Other member organizations would have input. But most importantly, from a mosaic sense, people in the trenches. Because what I see, again, lack of humility, institutional arrogance, edicts that come down from a boardroom at 30,000 feet up that aren't in the trenches don't get it right most of the time. So it's people in the trenches. Would, would we eliminate necessarily the rule on high school? I'm not sure, but it certainly would be liberalized. Playing high school, as the point has been made by my colleagues, is a quintessential American experience, very important social growth and happiness and ability to, to be a happy player. But it also fosters playing in front of a crowd. So we need to tweak a lot with respect to the academy, for sure. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Paul? Um, in terms of the Athletes Council, they vote 20% on these critical topics, and we spoke of a de December 10th board meeting. And um, they are not funded, and it's very difficult for them to get to organizations like U.S. Club Soccer and such prior to um, election, actually showing up to a board meeting and voting on something that they're not aware of. Um, I was one of those. Uh, athlete council board members and I requested to be funded for that very purpose. So ten years later we fall in that same trap and I agree that we're definitely uh, not going in the right direction in terms of uh, integrating our minds together and making these pertinent decisions. But one thing for, definitely is clear here, it's like a bullseye and the bullseye is completely aimed at the United States Developmental Academy and all the problems that lead to what we're discussing. A lot of these questions go back to the United States Developmental Academy and the problems it's caused. And when I think of the solution, it, we all talk about having a collective effort, um, one answer to channel those efforts together, and it's simple. It's the Olympic Developmental Program that currently U.S. club soccer has, and it could easily take to reform or put in the hands of the minds of the soccer people to decide how to reform the United States Developmental Soccer Academy under that umbrella. So all these questions are aimed at the same problem, and the same answer we're giving is under one umbrella. I believe the Olympic Developmental uh, Program solves that. I lived in Germany and went to high school in Germany in Berlin. And one of the great things we have in the United States is our educational institution where we play sports. My high school there, John F. Kennedy Schulich, didn't have soccer. I wish they did. Okay? It wasn't organized like it is in this country. I came back and I played four years of high school soccer, <coughs> uh, three years of high school soccer. Initially, the coach didn't select me. 
He was my biology teacher. Today I stand proudly to say, let's make all these um, high school coaches eyes of our, our efforts to find those new players. Because one thing I could say for certain is this academy program definitely found some of these new talented players in high schools. So if they're going into our high school to find them, <coughs> they know they exist. We could do a much better job at building this game with the collective effort. How'd you do in biology? East it. <laughs> <laughs> Eric? Just to reiterate what we've already, I don't what they've already said, but um, this decision, let's face it, isn't made at a table like this. It's made at the dinner table. And it's a family that gets to make that decision, in my opinion. Whether what the Federation should ever mandate something like this. It's just, it's a, it is a social experience. It is about the person more than it's about the player. And that is a decision that should be made by the family, period. Well, the mandate, DFB mandating the, the top two, I mean, you guys know this very well, top two Bundesliga's, a Bundesliga uh, levels having to take care of that academy issue. I mean, that's a mandate that you'd like to see from the Federation, not a mandate that goes across an entire landscape that's completely different than a, a country that has one sport. It ruined your career, though, that high school thing. Well, but, the, but the complexity of this uh, <laughs> launching a you know, developmental academy is the actual schedule. So some high school programs are on different timelines. One may be in the winter, one may be in the spring, etc. So it makes sense of why they try to do it, but the complexities go far beyond just not playing high school soccer. Right. You can't play any high school other sport. Yeah. It's and a, it's a tough when you start yeah. looking at the complexities, and I coach at this age group, but it's their they have to a, take uh, PE. And PE, sometimes they do a sport because it counts for PE, and some of them don't want to do PE at the, at, the, at the school. They'd rather do a sport because... Simply, they don't want to shower at the school. So there's there's a real simple uh, issues here, but I understand what the complexities are, but it didn't work. I'll, I'll make a quick editorial comment on this subject, because <clears throat> I was chairing a federation technical committee when we started the academy, and I was personally very opposed to the, the ban on high school soccer. I, I just didn't think it made sense from a personal development standpoint. Um, you know, last I checked, and I made this point at the time, <clears throat> The best players, the most accomplished players in U.S. national team history, so Michelle Akers, Eric Winalda, Paul Caligiuri, John Harks, Tab Ramos, Tony Miola, Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly, all played high school soccer. So it's not in and of itself a debilitating factor. So Look, I'm not, I'm not bragging here, but Kobe Jones and I played on the same high school team. We got to play in a World Cup together. So it, it is. Right. It is. Something. Tab Ramos, John Arts. Did you not win? Play, never Ramos. play the same. And then I went to UCLA too. Don't don't get Car Cardi is a lot bigger than you think. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, all right. So I think uh, we we've heard you guys' opinions on that. And I appreciate it very much. Now, uh, John Rennie, uh, the uh, who who was castigated earlier by unfairly, I would say, by Kyle <laughs> Martino. I'm just a sore loser. So. <laughs> okay. so John. No one wants to hear my two cents. That's fine. <laughs> Oh, he's always fun when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, John. I'm sorry. There's no salary. So how how any of you guys are going to take this job? Do you have to give up your not your family, but your salary uh, at a full time uh, position? How are you going to do that? What you do right now for your family, for your life, for your money? You're going into a role that's totally different than it used to be. So how would you deal with the fact that your life is going to change? Uh, and, and the finances of your situation is going to have to change. You can't keep a full-time job 24 hours a day and do the job that you... Solidarity tell payment. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's let uh, Steve Gans answer that first. I have a second question eventually. A follow-up? Okay. No, no, let's get over this one. Okay. <laughs> Steve? Well, well, it's a fair question. And, and so let's talk a little bit about, about the position. So it is a 
president's position and it's unpaid. There's a vice president position, I believe, is also unpaid. And I do think it should be clarified at this point, and I mean by U.S. soccer, because in a, and, and Mike also, obviously you'll chime in and everyone else, but my read of this is this is a major nonprofit organization. And uh, while it's called president, and while it's called vice president, let's just focus on the president, it is really like chairman of the board of directors of, of the organization. In, 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 in a nonprofit organization, in fact, in Massachusetts, the attorney general has issued a position paper, which is sitting members of boards of directors of nonprofit organizations ought not to be compensated. And, and that's separate and apart from the normal nonprofit standard of reasonable compensation to be paid to someone in a nonprofit. So if you separate it from a corporate governance perspective, you've got directors and you have officers. Officers are the people in Chicago, Dan Flynn, CEO on down, who are getting paid and they're full time there. This, the nomenclature of this position is president. President actually is an officer. In other words, that's not a director, it's an officer. But it's unpaid and it's not cited in Chicago. In a technical sense, in most companies, a president is below a CEO. So if this weren't clarified, and this were technically a full-time president's job, then this job would be under the CEO of at U.S. Soccer. So we have a semantics, at, at a minimum, a semantics issue here. Uh, my understanding is this has been, this is more like a president of the board of directors, therefore appropriately unpaid. If it were cited in Chicago uh, as a full-time officer, that would be a completely different story. Now, to your question, John, about how, so I've spent a lot of time, a good friend of mine is, is CEO of, uh, of WGBH in Boston, which is the major public television and uh, also has national public radio as well, but um, and producer of 50% of all PBS programs in the country, like Frontline, etc. And I've talked to him at length about a similar size organization, his a little bigger, about how that role works and how his chairman of the board of director does it. And I've cleared this with my managing partner and my uh, the management committee of my firm. And they've cleared me to spend as many hours as I need to spend on it. Um, but that I would not resign my partnership and I would still be uh, working uh, at my firm because my belief is as many hours as it takes, it will uh, be devoted to. But the question about whether uh, it be paid under my interpretation, uh, clear interpretation of, 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 of law in Massachusetts at least, and I think in most jurisdictions, the chairman of the board of directors or any director in nonprofit ought not to be paid. So that's how I've approached it. But I do agree there's confusion out there. It's a minimum of semantics, and it needs to be uh, clarified. Thank you, Steve. Um, Kyle, you've actually addressed this pretty yeah. directly in your statements. And, and I've actually already been battling with the board a bit. I've had a couple conversations with them. I, um, I was on the phone last night with uh, Dan Flynn, and what you'll find is there's an appetite internally uh, to make it a full-time paid position, and it absolutely should be a full-time paid position. By the way, it should be a full-time paid position if Sunil gets into this race and, and, and wins the election. Here's why. Right now, um, I mentioned it before, there's, there's a board who all of them have other full-time jobs, and, and, and as a part-time job, to come in to try and oversee U.S. soccer. Now, I said they fell asleep at the wheel. That's actually not my word. Someone on the board actually said that to me. Um, how, how they're going to uh, address this issue, and I said they're meeting in, in a few days about this, they're going to, because they can't change the bylaws uh, without the AGM, a supermajority, they're going to change policy to try and shape it into a chairman of the board as it was intended. Um, I think that's a really dangerous course correction right now, and I understand the knee-jerk the knee response because they feel a president just did the job the way it wasn't intended. Um, we absolutely need a chairman of the board for the reasons I discussed before of, of the board, the makeup of the board, not really being entirely a group of soccer people, people that bring value but need a president that's doing the full-time job 
of meeting here, of going around and finding out what needs to be done in this country, of selling the game. I mean, that's the thing. If it's a business, what's the product? As Eric said initially, it's soccer. Uh, we don't have a lot of product experts out there making sure that they're selling the game the right way and making the good technical decisions, of course, not unilaterally. So what we need right now is a chairman of the board that can protect the business games, work symbiotically with Dan Flynn, should he stay on, which we should hope he, he will for uh, a little while to make sure there's some continuity, um, but to protect the board against the soccer blind spot that just got us in, in, in a real mess. And if we think that's a part-time job with a full board of part-time people, all of which having other jobs, I, I think it's a really, really dangerous thing to not capitalize on this opportunity while we, we reflect and look at ourselves in the mirror and say, this is our moment. This is our chance to finally hire, to uh, elect a, a soccer visionary who will hire the right people staff-wise to make the decisions that aren't being made in the right way, that empower the associations and the groups that are doing so many great things. If we miss that opportunity, I'm fearful of, of where this thing heads. This could be a binary choice of electing the business guy who's admitted they're not a soccer guy, who needs to hire the soccer guys, or electing the soccer people who will finally give the power back to the people that can make good decisions. And I'm fearful if we miss this opportunity, it might not come up again in the near future, especially with 16-year 16, 16 term limits on the board side. So listen, we can, we can work within the current structure if we first identify the fact that one barrier to entry for quantity and quality candidates is the fact that it is an unpaid position that's part-time. I've already quit my job. Uh, I, I don't know, Eric, I'm not, I don't know your situation, you can correct me on this, but I, maybe you are too. We're the only people that's, that have actually quit our jobs to do this. And this is costing us a lot of money to do this, but that's fine because plenty of people volunteer to do this job. But why you make it a salaried position, listen, it's silly of me to do that strategy-wise because if I'm elected February 10th, my job's going to be harder after my first term to keep it because it's a paid position and quality candidates are going to come in if I don't do the right job. That barrier to entry has led to a, a president who's gone unopposed, not single-handedly, but has contributed to that. That's transparency. That's accountability. You work for U.S. soccer. We know what your salary is. And your job is to finally be the conduit, finally be the one that gets with the soccer culture here and, and finally creates a system of making good technical decisions, <clears throat> creates a captain's council of advisory uh, board that can help us make those decisions at the U.S. soccer level. <clears throat> Um, I, I really think if we miss this and, and, and when the board is successful in slamming the stable door shut after the horse bolts, um, we're not going to grow this game the way we need to because it needs to be grown with someone that's willing to get out there and not only sell the sport. We know the name of every single commissioner in every single sport. I don't even watch them, but I know these guys. If we don't do that now, we're just destined to, to sit in the stasis. Uh, I, I know it, and I'm seeing the resistance as an example of a group that's hesitant to, to change in the way that we know that we need to change. Paul? <clears throat> it's common throughout the world that a, a president of a soccer federation governing body is paid. Um, that would lead me not to be opposed to something like that, but certainly that's not why I'm running to for U.S. Soccer Federation president is to um, make that an initiative. I do believe that um, this is a situation where there's a lot of opportunities for U.S. soccer to get it right and build this game in the right way and to do some meaningful projects, initiatives, and grow this game how we've never seen it before. And it doesn't come just on the growth of the $150 million. It's what's to come. And it has to be done with the members, aligning U.S. soccer with the members. That is why I'm running. In terms of any job or conflict of interest, I will leave it immediately and be honored to represent U.S. Soccer Federation, the president, in, so I could put the extra time in. Um, <clears throat> the extra time it will take to bring people together, to find the right people, to go to the right organizations in the communities at all levels and form meaningful committees that will be able to steer this country to become the best in the world. I want to win a World Cup on the men's side, and I'd set the goal to be 2022. And it's a mindset. I want to win the Women's World Cup back-to-back. -back. 
I want to have the best professional league in the world. I think there's a lot of passionate people that would love to see the grassroots level grow and get into urban areas and do great things. And it's those people I want to bring together. And I believe I'm the right person for that job. Um, <clears throat> Michael? Uh, well, boy, is, it, is it your turn, Mike? Go ahead. Well, my, I'm not a lawyer, but my wife is. <laughs> that's, that's answer number one. I'm prepared for both. Both, If, if this becomes a paid position, so be it. But if, if, if it's not, I'm prepared for that. Eric, do you think it should be a paid position? Do you have an opinion? You know, I think, I think the... <clears throat> The reasons why it isn't are very clear. It's the things we don't talk about. I think you alluded to it. It makes it very difficult for someone to run against the incumbent when, when it's, it's not a paid position. And maybe just didn't want us to see his tax returns, too. I don't know. But the truth is, is that <laughs> the truth is, is that it is a job that requires a lot more than it's getting right now. So if, if it is a, a situation where um, the, the board, as, as Kyle has alluded to, because there is a, an appetite for that, he's right, that they have tried to essentially make it a paid position in the past, and he's, he's uh, actually chose not to. So that was that's the way that went down. So we'll see how, how it plays out. And just real quickly, sorry, sorry to follow up if you don't mind. Um, the association thing, and this is kind of where they jump back and forth between corporation versus, versus you know, Olympic committee and the rules there. I mean, to compare us to... You know, to, to, to USA badminton or, 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 you know, Taekwondo or baseball or ba basketball. I mean, it's just not a fair comparison. I mean, we are a much different organization than any of those. We've missed out on three of the last four Olympics, and I was part of a group that missed out on Athens. To, to, to use that as a precedent when that's a cog in a much bigger wheel. And, and, and many people at the table alluded to how different this is than where it started. To, to, to use precedent like that as a two, and I think it's dangerous to compare us to groups that we look nothing like in a crowded sports landscape where the number one job of U.S. soccer should be growing the game. If that's a part-time job, whew. Michael? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, this goes back, and I think I've mentioned this to some of you earlier, U.S. soccer's growth has outpaced its governance. And you can be cynical about it, and there's reason to be cynical about it, or you can look at it as, you know, with, with less cynical eyes and just say, this is, you know, I, I see this all the time with startups. When something starts in a garage, it requires different governance than it does when it grows into a billion dollar a year tech company. And things have just, you know, haven't kept up. Of course it needs to be a paid job. And it needs to be a well paid job, because this is a very big job at a very big company, you need qualified people. And like everybody here has said, there is a very serious barrier to getting qualified people when you don't pay them for a full-time job. And you know, John, you were talking about it's a full-time job. You know better than anyone here, coaching in college, I had a very brief time at Richmond relative to your career. It is a, you know, recruiting and scouting and dealing with your administrator and by the way, a coach and a trainer. U.S. soccer president, and we can talk about what name you want to call it and how you want to restructure it, paying the position is not a problem, is, is, is wearing a, it, it, it's many hats, it's an incredibly powerful position, it is running a very, very large corporation. It absolutely has to be paid. To answer your other question, I will not accept a salary as U.S. soccer president. I would absolutely make sure that, uh, do what I could to make sure that a salary is written into the bylaws for whomever the next president would be. And if they decided to implement the salary while I was in office, I would use that money to to all the things that need funding in U.S. soccer. I wouldn't take a dime of it. For no reason other than, I don't think, I think there's something very unseemly with taking an office and then having a bylaw change to pay yourself. That said, it has to happen. It needs to happen soon because it's hurting U.S. soccer, not just in terms of qualifications, but integrity and all the other things that go along with that kind of background. Well, but depending on how it's brought up, 60 days before the AGM, it could be voted on before, before you become president, which would be an interesting line in the sand to see who's for it. Well, yeah, it, that'll depend on the agenda, obviously. <clears throat> um, Steve Gans, you, you had a quick follow-up? Yeah, the follow-up, Kevin, is just to clarify for everyone, because we, we can talk about what it should be or what it is, but we, everyone, for everyone's sake, we need clarification. And, and, and the reason none of us can know right now is, is, like I say again, in normal corporate governance, a president is beneath a CEO in most companies. 
And, and so that by itself bespeaks the idea that there's confusion. And I think it needs to be clarified by the Federation. Whether or not this is a true present position, you know, cited in, in Chicago, or whether or not, and, and, then, and therefore underneath the CEO, or whether or not it is uh, really chairman of the board. None of us can know it. What we can identify is there's a fiction here of some sort. Um, because of that corporate governance issue. That's why I just wanted to say that for everyone. I'm going to ask a, a, a quick follow-up, which kind of follows along these lines because it specifically relates to governance. Um, the governance of the Federation was uh, <coughs> reconfigured about uh, 10 years or so ago. It came in the wake of the scandal around the USOC, uh, and a lot of the national governing bodies changed uh, the structure of their boards and so forth. The Federation went from a 42-member board to the board that we have today, which is two pros, two youth, two adults, four athletes, the president, the past president, a vice president, and either four or six, I, I don't remember exactly, either four or six independent directors. My question to each of you, and I, I'd like to try to answer this in less than a minute if you can, <clears throat> do you think... It, is this an organization that needs independent directors? And if so, is that the right number? <clears throat> and I'll, Cal, I'll start with you. Um, I think independent directors are healthy. Um, the question comes into play, um, do, they, do they become independent directors prior to the election or after the election because some of their terms are up? And some of this information is not disclosed, but I think it's healthy to have independent directors um, providing outside information. I'd understand that uh, the definition of independence is that they have basically no connection to soccer. I mean, they could be maybe a parent or something, but they can have had no, nobody around this table could ever be an independent director of U.S. soccer. So that's just a clarification. Kyle? I mean, just, I think it's, it's a ratio question and it's a person question. I mean, uh, what what ratio of the board are the are, are made up of, of that demographic? I think it's dangerous to have too many independent direct, directors. Um, I think that what's important is that for one second, just I'll get back to the board. Forget the makeup of the board for a second. What needs to happen is before decisions get to the board, they need to be put through a process of experts, put through a a whittling down of options. Let's say the head coach, which is something I know that the board is going to be looking into and trying to change the policy about head, head coaches hired. You know, a, a, a decision for a new head coach for the U.S. men's team right now, that, that should be a list that's created by, by an advisory board that has expertise in trying to identify the quality of a candidate. Then it should be vetted by a president who actually reaches out to make sure we're not wasting time with presidents that, or uh, coaches that have no interest in, uh, in taking the job. For instance, I've reached out to um, Dave Wagner's people. He's not interested right now, so let's not waste time chasing someone like that. Then you have an opportunity with Athletes Council and other groups that are within the U.S. soccer structure, by the way, who are a bit upset that they're not leaned on enough. And you mentioned this before, sort of the task force and the lack, lack of follow-up. Um, we can use, obviously, this board and other boards to help us get this list together. And then you can bring something to a board that has a high ratio of independent um, directors and independent board members who are, are, are capable and qualified to make really big decisions and oversee big decisions that have macro impact on a company. But if we're not vetting that process and it's not going through the hands of experts before it gets to the board, then the ratio of, of having those independent people on the board becomes dangerous where we're left in a situation with a huge soccer blind spot that's led us to where we are right now. Okay. Michael? Yeah, you know, Kevin, the fact that you even need to ask that question is frustrating to me because it shows, again, how the governance at U.S. soccer has, has just not kept pace with its growth. This is when, when, you know, a law firm like mine deals with this all the time. And of course you need independent directors, and of course you need the right balance. So think of it in two ways. On the one hand, you need interested directors because they know things. They have knowledge. They have institutional knowledge. They're the ones that are being impacted by these decisions. Of course you need those. In a case like U.S. soccer where you've got so many different interests, they're actually going to balance each other out. You have less of a need for independent directors 
In a typical scenario, you have Microsoft. All of the inside directors work for Microsoft. Their interests are Microsoft. You need outside directors, independent directors, to balance that. <clears throat> when you've got competing interests, they're actually balancing each other. You still need independent directors, however, free of conflicts of interest, to vote objectively on matters and to deal with things in an objective way. I'm not so sure, I think, it, I don't know what the, the definition here for US soccer is of an independent director. If it is as you're describing, I would, I would think it would need to be changed. Because what it needs to be is not somebody who's never touched a soccer ball, not, never, not no, somebody who's never been involved in any capacity. It just needs to be somebody who does not have a vested interest in the decisions being made by U.S. soccer. So, for example, U.S. club is an interested party. You would not be an independent director. A, a college coach, of course a college coach is generally impacted by decisions, but that's less of a direct interest, and I would think that that person absolutely could be an independent director. And I do think you need independent directors uh, as any board would. And I have to say that when you go to council and raise this issue, there will be solutions put in front of U.S. soccer very, very quickly, no matter who you go to, because these are situations, and when I said I was frustrated, these are situations that have been dealt with. It's like reinventing the wheel. These things have been dealt with for years and years and years in the private sector out of need. And U.S. soccer has just been a little tone there. To be fair, U.S. soccer did add independent directors. It, and, it, and, and Council Latham and Watkins were very involved in that process. Kevin, um, how many are there now, right now? I'm sorry? How many independent? I, I, I don't recall if it's four or six. Okay. Um, it, it was four, but I thought that they added two more. I might be wrong about that. So anyway, Eric. That well, sounded like consistent with what, what Michael just said. I, I think it's important to, important to have impartial voices in the room that will help you make solid decisions, of course. Whether that number is the right number, it should be evaluated, though. Steve? Steve? I can answer this one less than a, yes, I can answer this in less than a minute because I largely agree with Mike completely on this one, and I think in this case was a good answer, very good answer. Um, you know, in, independent directors are there to be a, a watchdog. Independent directors are there when interested directors have to recuse themselves, so they have to vote on issues. Um, it absolutely is a critical, critical function. It should be there. In terms of the ratio, that needs to be looked at, and I, I think, I think again, Mike's answer as to that w w was a good one. Um, you know, the interested directors have an important role, but the but especially given a platform, I think of most of us, about improved ethics, uh, the independent director role is essential. Ratio to be determined going forward. Okay. Um, Christian, you have a question? <clears throat> yeah. I, I, we've talked a lot, and our interest is mostly in the youth space and the development space, and we, we've talked a lot. I mean, the Development Academy has had a bullseye on it for a variety of different reasons, and if the best we've talked about is that it's produced technically better players, but it's been de divisive, there's been all sorts of other issues with it, uh, it raises the question of why have it? And when you're a member-based organization, which the Federation is, uh, the members should, the, the interests of the members, you almost have a fiduciary obligation to look out for them. So my question would be, under your leadership, is the Federation, would the Federation move more in the direction of operating leagues and, and de facto operating clubs through those leagues or more in the direction and this ties back to the initial question I think at the beginning of, of this forum of more in the direction of being an educational body in all the forms, referee, coaching, administrative, uh, a standard setting body through a collaborative process with the technical input of a variety of different people um, and then a national team and national training center program operating body, but not in the business of league management and club management. Because I think that's a sharp divide in the youth world as to the role of the Federation as a member-based organization and what its programs are doing or not doing with respect to development and the effectiveness and the efficacy of those programs and also what that does to the members who are trying to grow the game. And we've all had the discussions of it's very difficult to grow a game when you're not sure what the future is going to bring, and platforms you bring and you build all of a sudden have something removed from them or a new competitor on the horizon 
from an organization that you're a part of. So um, I'm, let's let's try to keep this to like a minute and a half because we've already addressed some some parts of that. Um, I'll start with Steve. I need to start giving Greg a heads up before I call on Steve because he has to unmute him. Sorry, Steve. I'm here. I'm here. Thanks. It's being unmuted for me um, out there in Chicago. So, uh, you know, the question, should the Federation as a general matter be involved in running leagues? And I think the answer is no. Um, but does that mean as a corollary that the DA should just be blown up right away? I'd say no to that, too. We have it something that needs to be studied, it needs to be, I mean, I have specific, again, having lived it seven years, I, I, if I had my autocratic way, which I'm not going to have and don't want to have, you know, I, I would change this, this, and this about the development academy. It's, again, another situation where the constituents will come in and, and the relevant parties, and it will be substantially tweaked. So I'm not saying eliminate the development academy, but I do absolutely agree that the uh, uh, that the Federation, as a general matter, should not be uh, in the business of running leagues. Now, what does that mean, though? Does it mean that the Federation should be laissez-faire and just let uh, the Wild West happen um, amongst club soccer? No to that, too. Again, I talked, I guess we're three hours into this, and I talked right at the beginning about um, this metaphor being drawn on a paper napkin for me, and that was Federation, 4 million players, top line, horizontal, looking down, not at all, on the chaos going out there, so going out underneath. And I do think that the battle between sanctioning organizations is inimical and counterproductive to, to happy players, happy parents, growth of soccer in this country. So that is part of the fractiousness that needs to be solved, and the Federation has a role there, and the fact that the Federation has been so laissez-faire about it is a bad thing. So uh, in general, let the clubs do their thing, Yes, but, you know, again, with, with, with some guidance and uh, input from, from the Federation, it cannot be a complete laissez-faire situation because we have the result we have right now. So, A, not generally in the business of running leagues, but B, still involved to the extent of making sure that everyone's on the same page and that there's, there is, for want of a better term, one big tent, so we're moving youth soccer forward from all the way up to the pros. Okay, Paul. Christian, congratulations on all the success. East Sentinel has a, been involved with many female players that have gone on to big things and enjoyed that gaming circuit. But to answer the question directly, the answer is no, and we'll find it overwhelmingly that being the answer with every candidate, perhaps just one that's since announced. But um, certainly the, the answer to it, to immediately... Um, transfer the control that U.S. Soccer Federation has in this space of running a gaming circuit, a league, so to say, under the umbrella of United States Soccer Development Academy, is simply <coughs> put it under the United States Developmental Program so organizations like U.S. Club Soccer can immediately get to work in doing the reform that's necessary. Paul, can I follow up on that question? Is, is, as Steve alluded to, the idea of moving the academy into a platform where U.S. Club Soccer and ID2 and U.S. Youth Soccer with ODP would there for start running <coughs> the DA, how do you envision that actually would work with competing organizations now... You know, one of the things that, as an academy director, you know, it does make sense that the federation would, or those within the federation might view as the competing organizations being part of the problem, which is why they grabbed a hold of this in the first place. How does transferring the DA, as it's known today, back into U.S. Youth Soccer and U.S. Club Soccer, you guys figure out now, you're going to take these, this bit, and you're going to take this bit and run it, how, how does that work? Yeah, it's a very good question, and it's already in a uh, fractionalized system, so to say, has created another uh, hurdle to overcome in a fractionalized system, be it that it does 
transfer under the umbrella of Olympic Developmental Program, but it's not impossible because it does take reforming. And there's got to be a transitional period. But on the counter of that, if U.S. club soccer, in my opinion, U.S. club soccer and U.S. YSA don't do anything by umbrelling that under the United States Developmental Program, the United States the development programs will be taken away and put above you into the United States Developmental Academy. So it's either or. Either or. Blanket it under what you have now and reform it and get to work, or it's being taken away eventually, and what happens there is massive shifts in registrations. Um, <clears throat> Eric? Well, look, I, I think going backwards to answer your question, is it necessary at all? Um, it sh the role of the academy should be lessened significantly. Because you got to ask yourself this, what are you preparing these kids for? If, if, it's, if it's about league play. It is. If you ever are going to produce a player that's going to be a professional athlete, um, what are they going to what are they going to be doing? Now, if you look at what the academy is, that's exactly what a national team would be. It's forced friendship. It's a bunch of all stars that get brought into a group, and that group should actually change weekly. It should if, if it's a really a true academy. So it's they should work hand in hand. There should be some cohesion there. But there's just sorry, there's just too many academies right now. They're making it they're making it difficult for the clubs to do their job. End of story. Can I say one more thing, Christian, just to be 100% clear? Come December 10th, this all may be a mute issue, because there will be a vote, and the vote will be to expand the developmental academy beyond what we've seen before. <clears throat> and that will be the, the, the time period where regardless if there's a new president, it'll be very difficult what, Mike, you're asking to make that transformation to create all that, it'll take longer. It'll take longer as this academy grows and manifests even to greater, making it very difficult on U.S. club soccer and U.S. YSA because you have members, <laughs> and you serve those members, which are those clubs. That's a vote that the DAs, the, the academies themselves are taking? <laughs> the board of directors for U.S. soccer oh, oh, US is soccer. meeting <laughs> on December 10th, where it will expand... It'll expand to eight age groups, starting at 12 to 19, both genders, and um, oh, it will it's happen already, to... It's, it's already at 12 to 19. No, they're filling in, there's no more dual No, 16, 17, 18, 19. Oh, they're no longer gap years. Gap and they're adding, he's saying groups. they want to add three levels. levels. That'll be three levels. Uh, so what I do know... It seems like a massive event. We, it, it, this is the sure. problem. We, we want to stop people fighting from each other and work together and collectively to build this game. And that hasn't been the leadership for this over 10 years. So I think that's why we have legitimate candidates running for U.S. Soccer Federal uh, That's the first I've heard of this. I don't know about most of these people about a vote on December 10th. Could you provide that information? Because I think that's something... Well, we'll ask... We'll what ask. I've done is asked... Uh, board members directly these questions and they tend to say the same things about how they come to the board meetings and things are already completed and done and it goes straight to vote. Right. Imagine if this has been 10 years in the works, you could anticipate the last board meeting prior to the election, it's going to be a good one and they're not going to change their ways. So there's a lot of little key things that I want to be clear on is I've had discussions with clubs that have been already um, formally proposed to go their entire club being registered directly with the U.S. Soccer Federation, not just their academy clubs. I do have it in uh, writing. I do know uh, three examples in Southern California that are massive clubs, and I do uh, know about the um, <clears throat> how, they, how they've gone about um, those proposals. So this, what I'm this saying, is an issue that we'll address with Collins, who is our representative, and we'll ask some others as well because we're technically represented by four people on the board. So, Paul, we appreciate that intelligence. Um, Eric, were you finished? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kyle? That was a pretty quick answer, to be honest. Um, this is only like a 90 second. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll go quick. Um, the answer, I, I, I should, I, Mike hasn't spoken yet, but I think the answer is clear that there shouldn't be a 
further encroachment into the area that I think is already being served. And that further, I think, creates a climate of mistrust. That mistrust right now is our biggest problem. There is no trust within the, 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 the membership that the Federation is service, servicing them the way it was intended to. Um, a lot of these decisions were made without most of the membership, so it would be, I think, catastrophic to continue down that path thinking that's the solution. I agree with Steve. Um, you know, I think an assessment and an audit of the efficacy of some of these decisions should happen before another knee-jerk reaction. I think the Development Academy in many ways has created more problems than it's solved. But I, I think continuity, especially if we have a new president, is essential right now as we really take a full assessment of when we get behind the curtain, what's going on. I mean, transparency, I think, is a part of everyone's platform. And that, that's no that's no coincidence. You know, we didn't all, I mean, Eric and I did pick the same sweater, but if, if all of us was wearing, were wearing the same one, you'd be a little bit concerned. The fact it's transparency is because things like this seem, the political parallels are hard to avoid. It's kind of like trying to pass the, the ACA without a CBO vote. You know, I mean, it, it, the fact that things are happening without our knowledge, uh, it, it concerns me because it's the way things have been done for a while. Michael? Well, being colorblind, I didn't even notice you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Christian, I, I'd ask you to look at this a little bit differently, very slightly. Because you said, should U.S. soccer be involved in running leagues? I think the question is, should U.S. soccer still be involved in running leagues? And the reason I say that is, again, I want people to think about how this evolved to where it's come, to the point that it's at now. There probably was a time when I was growing up, when, when the candidates here were growing up, or you guys were, when it might have made more sense for U.S. soccer to have a bigger hand in helping to run leagues. There were a lot of leagues that probably couldn't find people to run them. Now that U.S. soccer is as big as it is, now that the industry is as big as it is, this is no different than the rest of our private sector. And I have represented big companies countless times in front of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the DOJ and antitrust matters and other matters. Across the board, it is clear that the government does not run businesses as well as the private sector. And so it should stay out of the business of running businesses. When there's, when in times of war, there are certain circumstances when the government needs to step in, bailouts, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that U.S. soccer should let the businesses run the business side of this. Um, how to achieve that? You know, of course, you, and I think you hit on it perfectly, U.S. soccer needs to have a hand in standards that, are come up, that, that they come up with collaboratively, uh, in the educational aspect, the national team aspect. There is a role for U.S. soccer in standardizing, in, in minimum standards, easily digestible. Uh, state-of-the-art ways, um, but we have to stay out of the business of, of getting involved in these businesses. And by the way, in typical situations in the corporate world, where a company has been running a competing business for a while and finds that it should no longer be in that business, that's what spin-offs are, right? There are, there, there are, you know, maybe we should start thinking about portions of U.S. soccer that have evolved to where they are for no, through no fault of anybody, but maybe now it's time to spin them off and let private businesses in a multi-billion dollar a year enterprise compete. Uh, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Did Steve already answer that? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. You went first. Okay. Um, John, you have you have a question, and then after John's question, I think we're going to, we'll start to move into the summary period. <clears throat> it might be part of the summary uh, question is, uh, if you're in this position, then you are either the president, the CEO, the leader, the boss, of this organization. So why should we vote for you with some of your past endeavors where you have been in that situation, not part of the company, but the boss, the leader, the president, the owner of a specific uh, situation you can relate to us, why you would be the best person that we should vote for? So let's... Let's just hold that thought a second. Is there anybody else here at the table or on the phone that has a specific question they want to ask? That's a great question. Uh, Casey? Mine's on a, uh, on a strategic level for you guys individually, but with the potential of the 2026 World Cup, um, to me the role of the president is bringing those three nations together um, to present that to the world. And so my question to you would be, how do you bridge the gap 
with the relationships in CONCACAF, in Mexico, in Canada, <clears throat> and FIFA as a whole to help make sure that that comes together and your vision on that. So let's, if, if you don't mind, let's make that two minutes each, um, and we'll start with Kyle. Um, so, so first off, whether Sunil's president or not, he's going to be integral in the 2026 bid. I think one of his accomplishments that, that I think he deserves more credit for is getting a seat uh, at, a, at, at a big governing board. And to have done that has given us a bit of clout that we didn't have in the past. And any talk of excommunicating Sunil or disparaging him, I think, shows a lack of strategy at a minimum, but a, a lack of vision in terms of needing to work symbiotically with him. Now, that doesn't mean agree with everything he does, but that means make sure you put him in a position where that bid is as strong as it possibly can be. Because we might feel really good against Morocco, uh, but we've seen it go different ways for various reasons. So um, the other side of things is... Should Sunil not run or, or lose the election, I mean, I would imagine he replaces Dr. Bob, right, on, on the board as the, yeah, so he's involved any way you, you, you talk about this. So what we have to do is, again, this is not a part-time job. We have to go out and sell why 1994 was a massive success, and we are a much greater soccer nation now than we were then, and approach Canada and approach Mexico in a, in a way that's more <coughs> lateral, and this goes to kind of the discussion of within U.S. soccer, which sometimes there's a bit of arrogance, and there's a bit of, you know, you're kind of lucky to be doing business with us. We have to make sure that we feel lucky that Mexico and Canada are a part of this bid to make it much stronger. Uh, it kind of speaks to some of the areas that I think a lot of the Liga MX and, and the Mexican culture exists in our culture. We have this remarkable, wonderful Hispanic culture, and, you know, you can talk about... California, you know, California, and I talked with Derek the other day about how important it is to embrace that. I never had a Spanish-speaking pro coach growing up. I mean, that, that's a big problem that we aren't really embracing where the soccer culture actually exists in this country. This is a really unique opportunity to make sure that we create the best chance Ten seconds. to get this bid. Because forget the men, I'm not qualifying for Russia. If we fail to get 2026, that is absolutely catastrophic, and we can't afford to let that happen. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Eric? I'm going to agree with that, uh, that that last part, but I do think that some of those uh, relationships could use some mending as well. Uh, that's that's the part that no one talks about. I do believe the snail will be involved, uh, regardless, and having a seat at the table is, uh, of course, uh, an important part of this. But let's not discount all the work that's already been done up to this point. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cautiously optimistic about our bid, but I do think that um, we'll all all arrows are pointing in that direction, that uh, we've, we've already put our best foot forward and put a, a great bit together. But I do think, uh, to Kyle's point, in working with Sunil, whether you agree with him or, or not, um, he's going to be there. He's going to be around, not just in, in the uh, uh, the chair of, of taking Dr. Bob's spot or, and or with FIFA, but there there is some there is some work to be done there. That's what we need to understand. Working with FIFA, working with CONCACAF, some of those those bridges aren't uh, as sturdy as we might think, and I think that in my conversations with with FIFA, for example, I think they've been starving for a soccer conversation for a long time. So there's there's a lot more uh, meat on that bone than we we think, but still, I think we're in a good spot. Eric, thank you, um, <clears throat> Paul. Yeah, Casey, uh, it's uh, I come from a different angle here because I sat on the board of directors when we put the bid in for 2018 and 22 and actually lost it and we did approach it from how great we were from the last World Cup and how great things were and it w didn't fall in lines with what, what FIFA was looking for was building infrastructure and supporting nations that would um, move forward so um, I didn't like the approach I think that we're in a situation now where the current president will sit at a, a past president position in terms of um, we, we can't afford to lose this opportunity, um, we've had some failures, not just not qualifying for the World Cup, <coughs> but losing the bid for the World Cups. Um, it's very important that we do anything and everything we can to put the right people forward to lead that board. And if the, the issues we're talking about, and these are not just issues that we're bringing up, these are known <coughs> issues 
of inequality with women. I don't think that's going to go well with, you know, corporate America or the corporations that support World Cups, etc. There are current lawsuits going on as we speak right now. These are very sensitive topics that must be evaluated when the time comes in order to, be it that there's a new president, other than the current president right now, um, that's not part of that administrative staff, it would have to be evaluated based on the timing of that. Because it is so sensitive and critical that we do win the um, 2026 World Cup bid. In saying that, it's interesting, one of my initiatives would be to have a technical director um, hired by U.S. Soccer Federation, and most recently we've seen a World Cup athlete from Mexico land that position in the Mexican Football Association. So those working relationships are very easy for um, myself to navigate to find the right people to continue to build those relationships within our CONCACAF region. Thanks, Paul. Michael? <clears throat> There's no question that the 2026 World Cup is critical. We have to get it. I think Sunil absolutely should stay on. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's there's no reason to remove him from that. It's He's gotten it to this point. He's got a lot of history there. Uh, you know, what I do all the time is step in and get up to speed on things really quickly in litigations. I'm sure all of us, you know, have done that in the past. So, uh I don't think there's any one person that's absolutely indispensable, but of course it would be beneficial to have him stick around. In terms of CONCACAF, the U.S. needs to play a leading role in CONCACAF. I've said this before in the past. I mean, the, the is, I don't think, other than the guys, not including me, sitting around this table right now on this side, not many people realize, I, I don't think, how hard it is to go into some of the countries in CONCACAF and play an away game. I think the U.S. needs to step in and get more credit for CONCACAF, more respect for CONCACAF, and look, Sunil and U.S. Soccer has done a good job of making it easier than it ever was to qualify for the World Cup, but we need even more respect, we need to do even more. And when we step in, and the U.S. absolutely should play a leadership role in this, but when you step in and play a leadership role, probably with a different governance style that's been done in the past, you see what happens outside of soccer. Diplomacy changes at the drop of a hat. When somebody comes in with a fresh perspective, with a different style, is more inclusive, is more respectful of, our, of other people in CONCACAF and what they have to offer and their opinions and their qualities, I think that a lot of those issues will be mended, like Eric was saying needs to happen, and I think the, the respect will be earned for the U.S. to take the leading role that it needs to take in CONCACAF. Steve? So I think the original question was was how we're going to deal with with our friends in Canada and Mexico, and let me address that first. And I think I think as Kyle spoke first, and it absolutely is a situation uh, wherein we need to uh, speak and relate to them without any institutional arrogance, like they're lucky to be uh, you know there with us. Um, I analogize it. You know, every person is important. Every federation is important. I analogize it to uh, the head of a Vermont State Association who gave me one of the best ideas uh, of, of the whole campaign. And I think that, you know, he's from a, a smaller state, doesn't usually get much attention. You take every person as a person. You respect uh, every person who represents a, a federation. We have mending to do there, and I think that it should be nothing but a harmonious uh, joint bid. With respect to the actual bid itself, um, I agree Sunil is going to be involved in, in some way, shape, or form, but I'm a little concerned about any slippery slope notion that we don't get it unless he's deeply involved. Um, my belief is that we, we are in good shape, that it makes all the sense in the world. 2026, the first 48 team World Cup, we are a superb soccer nation filled with competent people. We've got the infrastructure and the facilities. And uh, the reality is that that people have asked me whether I would step in right away. And, and I have significant turnaround experience, obviously, both as a lawyer uh, representing Foxborough Stadium in the 94 World Cup and as a member of the venue bid committee. And so I very much uh, have the competency to get involved. But my hope is, and these are the answers I've given, that I don't have to get involved at all, that in fact that we are in 
good shape as we should be, that everything is above board in terms of the meritocracy, in terms of selecting it. And uh, I believe this is not bigger than one person. Or I should say it's much bigger than one person. It, no one person is big than the quest. We're filled with highly competent people in this country. And I think the expectation is that none of us, should we be fortunate enough to win, hopefully we'll have to step in in a turnaround situation. But, but if necessary, I'm sure everybody will be poised to do that. I think the country deserves the World Cup, and, and hopefully we're doing the right things now to make sure we get it. It's, uh, it's 2.30 uh, local time. Uh, we're going to move into the kind of summary uh, period right now. So I'd like, and I think we'll go back to the original um, alphabetical order on this. I'd like each of you to kind of make your case. And I, I would like you to address the following things in particular. Um, one, just as a, maybe a preface, uh, we, we currently, our sport loses about 75% of participants before the age of 13. Uh, when we talk about growth, the easiest way to grow is just not to lose as many. Um, what role do you think the Federation should play in retention? How important should it be? You don't need to get into a lot of tactics. <clears throat> But how big a how big a challenge should that? How big a priority should that be for for U.S. soccer? That's one. <clears throat> um, how are you different? You need to absolutely address that. It's it's been great that this has been such a cordial group, but we need we do need to hear how you're different from one another. <clears throat> um, well, if you want us to fight, we can arrange. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and obviously included in that should be the point that John raised about what, what is your specific experience being, quote-unquote, the boss? What experience do you have in leadership? Um, a ministerial question I think we'd all like to, to know is, do you, have, do you have three nominations yet? You don't have to tell us who, but we'd like to know if you do. Um, and, and I mean three nominations for members, not just people. Um, and then the last, the last point is, if you don't win, because somebody's not going to win uh, out of this, how will you continue to serve the game? What's, what, where do you see yourself aiding and addressing the issues that you've done a good job of, of pointing out? Um, if you want to tell us who, who you would support if you didn't win, you can do that. <laughs> but we're not going to require you to do that. So... Once again, so what we want to know is, first of all, player retention. How big a priority should that be? Um, how are you different? What specific leadership experience do you have that you think qualifies you for this role? Um, do you have the nominations? And if you don't win, how will you continue to serve the interests of the United States Soccer Federation? So with that, unless anybody has anything specific they want to add to that, um, Paul, you're up. With um, any b major business, it's important to do return and retention. That is just a simple business matrix I think we all are aware of. Um, certainly when we talk about 75% of losing players at the age 13, there's a reason for that. And there's many variables for that, of course. And uh, we're not the only sport that is um, looking at that kind of uh, decline. But that rate is high. Certainly it's very important for the United States Soccer Federation to do it. And obviously in my plan that I presented today, it was to continue to look for the growth and to target in areas that we haven't put emphasis on, particularly in uh, growth and accessibility um, by doing a comprehensive analysis and minority participation and uh, the representation of the soccer system in general and that would be particularly in the urban areas and um, lower income areas. And I believe by having a plan where we see an organic effort of coaches going into high school coaching, finding new talent, new markets, we need to do better there. And I believe we could grow this sport versus seeing these massive declines. So the growth efforts that I have, along with the focus on retention, would um, go hand in hand there. Uh, what makes me different, and I've, I've, I, I, I like to say I'm 
very alike by the candidates that we share today that are here in person and Steve Gans that's on the phone. And um, I've had the opportunity to be at the Got Soccer Forum with these guys and we've talked about very similar topics and issues under this format. And um, so we're saying very much alike the same concerns, the same issues, transparency, inclusiveness, merit, um, uh, development, in, in a vague way. But what makes me clearly different is that I've come with a solution that's imperative for, I believe, um, the growth of youth soccer in this country under a very uh, professional way with U.S. club soccer and with USYS. It makes up almost, what, 3.7 million of our members in youth soccer, and the program can extend into the 18-year-olds, <coughs> the 18 and 19, that we're leaving out that inc uh, critical um, age group. I believe under the United States Olympic Developmental Program, I've clearly stated to put the United States Developmental Academy into the hands that works. And that is U.S. Club Soccer and USYSA. That's clearly what makes me different, a solution. A solution that can make a difference now that I believe is before the election. It has to come together with an organization to not let them move one or two more steps deeper to where it would almost be virtually impossible to unwind because there's contracts. There's going to be contracts with the corporate sponsors. There's commitments with uh, members that actually physically start to pay, and it'd be hard to transition from that stage when people are committing in January to their clubs. Uh, the experience to be a leader is, um, I believe that's something I've always cultivated. I felt like I've always been the first to go somewhere, do something, and lead the way and, and, and do that, but certainly not on the, my efforts alone. There was many people that tried to do things, but it's uh, allowed me to come back to the country and, and, and could be leader. leader. What makes me a leader here for the United States Soccer Federation is the fact that I've been at every level, even from the grassroots to the coaching efforts that I do today, from coaching college to selection processes to playing at the highest levels, the A license for 15 years, etc. I've seen it for 15 years on the national team program. Imagine that, 15 straight years I played on the national team, and you could imagine how many coaches I went through. And every day you have to prove yourself on the merit-based system. This is not about a performance, a game, or a World Cup, or Olympics. This is about doing in practice. And coaches, of course, like the fact that you're able to bring people together in terms of being successful. I've done this here in the United States, in college, and in Germany. In terms of the, um, the official candidacy, I have not declared. I've talked to many people, and I haven't submitted my... Um, final um, resolution by the by the December 12th date, um, but I plan to have that completed um, in the next week. Serving uh, the game, obviously, I'm very fortunate and blessed to be an ambassador to this sport. I enjoyed this so much sitting together with this group of people today, talking about the game, and that's you know our lives. That's my life, and I definitely would like to serve it at all levels, and still staying committed to the game both domestically and internationally. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Paul, thank you very much. Um, Steve? Uh, Kevin, I salute you for a, a real disparate uh, group of questions, but they're, they're really incisive. So let me go down, <clears throat> uh, actually not in order. I'm going to say what makes me different at the end. But 75% uh, attrition, huge issue. And, and what, I, what I didn't say today, and maybe what I haven't said, is that in addition to representing... Uh, clubs and international clubs and, and, and advising uh, senior executives and CEOs of Premier League and, and, and Scottish clubs and British clubs. I also spend much of my time, uh, you know, obviously that's paid, but, but volunteering and advising parents in late May and June when tryouts are going on for their, for their kids' next club experience. And, you know, so I've not only experienced of a full parental uh, direct experience of, of being a youth soccer parent, but I've also, um, you know, experienced uh, the advice aspect 
maybe 40 to 50 parents every spring that I advise, and many of them are very perplexed about the status of their kid, <clears throat> what club they're going to be on, what messages they're getting back from the club. And so I see this attrition rate. I see this frustration. It's a huge issue. It really is. The, the age group changed by the Federation uh, imposed in mass really was tone deaf, another 30,000 square foot thing. So you wanted a short answer on it. Yes, the Federation should focus on that. Attrition issues are real. Uh, in some sense, they're particularly high for soccer, and it needs to be addressed, first point. Second, have the letters. Yes, I have more uh, than the requisite number of letters. Uh, uh, next point, um, terms of volunteering. So if I don't win, um, knock wood, I will continue to, to do what I can, volunteering and, and doing some pro bono legal work for clubs and uh, otherwise helping out uh, clubs and, and giving my, again, advice to parents and that sort of thing. I will say, uh, and I'll continue my formal roles in soccer that I've been doing for the last 25 years, um, uh, but, I, but I've learned so much about the Federation and the constituent members that, yes, I would like to get involved more. In fact, <clears throat> one member organization has already called me and asked me, should I not win, uh, would I like to join their board? And I kind of said, what are you telling me? <laughs> is, that, is that some kind of loaded <laughs> question? You, you think you have an idea of how the, how the election's going to go? Um, and they assured me no, but that, that they had been impressed with me. And, and so that would be something I would consider, something like that, getting more involved on a volunteer, formal basis um, within the Federation itself or its, its member constituencies. In terms of what makes me different, and John, I, I appreciate that question because it provides a great segue, which is, I think your specific question is, have you had experience leading an organization? And I think I'm proud to say, again, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but, but that I'm the only one that's actually done that, left, uh, ha has run uh, significant organizations. I started after the Baltimore Blast started, um, actually ran a family business to sell so my dad could retire for a couple of years. But then after law school, did join a, a firm in Boston, and after four years there, a client made me an offer to come in, be the general counsel, uh, but also take over the company. So for 18 years, depending on the company, we were a series of four book and publishing companies. Um, I ran uh, as either COO for the company or president or CEO um, those companies, those, those, those disparate companies. After 18 years, sold most of them except for one and then, and then ran uh, the remaining internet commerce one for, for three years. So, um, yes, I have significant experience, not just as a lawyer, but as a business executive, leading people and organizations. Um, and so I think that this is, and I think the, the size of the employees uh, at, at the Federation uh, is, is very similar, uh, I think about 200, to the size of the company that I ran. So I do have that experience. Otherwise, with respect to what makes me different, well, what, I, what I've said before is, you know, this is a huge job, and um, two weeks ago, uh, two weeks after the U.S. lost, it seemed that in the hysteria, all a lot of people were focusing on was, well, you got to be able to pick the next national team coach, and how's that going to happen? The men's national team coach, and that certainly is a very, very important component of the job. But it's a huge job that encompasses that and more. And as said before, it requires someone with both a confluence of deep soccer experience and a deep, deep background and continuous soccer experience with significant organizational leader, leadership experience, consensus building skills, conflict resolution skills, negotiation, and someone who's demonstrated superb judgment and, and leadership abilities all those years. And I think that my record shows that I do have that. I've not only advised people in the boardroom as an attorney, um, uh, clients as attorney, but I've also been the one leading the companies where the buck stops with you and where you have to make fast decisions and inspire people. So I do believe that, that I have that right combination of those jobs, and I think that that's a kind of a unique combination uh, for this role. Um, one question that I've been asked and I'll close with is it's come up with a lot of uh, either member organizations or state associations that have, that have asked me, give me an example of how you problem-solved or build consensus. How has your background prepared you for this job? How are you going to implement it here? And give me two examples. 
or at least two examples, and I'll just give you two, two now because they're timely and they're also in the soccer space. We're running out of time. And I will tell you that, okay, uh, I'll quickly just tell you within the last year, I uh, dealt with a dispute between two majority owners of, of an American pro soccer team, was able to bring them back to the table, and, uh, and also with two uh, youth clubs related to a merger that uh, hit, hit some headwinds. And we've been able to successfully, in both cases, uh, bring, bring resolution. So I will end with that, and I appreciate the time today. Steve, thank you very much. <clears throat> Kyle? Um, first off, thanks again for, for setting this up, and thanks everyone for taking the time to be here. I know um, both sides of the table are making sacrifices to try to grow this game, so, so thank you so much. And it fills me with a lot of optimism to to know that the right people are in place in a big way and what we need to do is empower people to help us grow this, this soccer culture. And, um, you know, player retention, I'll kind of go back to the analogy I used before of this, this iceberg and it starts rather big. Uh, and, and what we need to do instead of heating the water, start to cool it, start to find ways to keep people in the game. Um, also, I think more importantly, make sure that we cast a wider net by lowering the barrier to entry, which ends up being cost or access for a lot of people, and specifically cities like this where 50% of kids are more likely to play basketball than soccer. Now, some of that is a cultural paradigm that will take time to shift, but mostly it's because if you look at New York City, there's about 600 basketball courts and there's only about 50 soccer fields. So uh, there are amazing things being done. I talked with Ed Foster Simeon uh, for a while the other day, and you alluded to this earlier, Mike. Uh, a lot of good things, NYFC, LAFC, trying to build fields. Strategic partners like Target throwing millions of dollars at that, but we know what cities look like. There's not a lot of space, and it's a, it's a massive project to try to build fields. There's one way I'm, I'm trying to solve that problem. Together with Steve Nash, we've created a, um, an initiative called Over Under. I've flown all over this world, as many of you have, you know, chasing a ball, and what does every basketball court in South America and Europe have underneath the hoop. Well, it has a soccer goal. So we actually do have soccer fields all over these cities. And it would be a low-cost, high-impact strategy to go in with municipal relationships already established by LAFC, the U.S. Soccer Foundation, NYFC. So you mind if we spend a few thousand dollars to pop a couple goals underneath all these hoops? Uh, that leads you to a municipal decision of a lot of new schools are being built, but there's no strategy on creating futsal courts and, and, and other things that are part of the landscape. We know the football field's going in. We know the basketball court's going in, so you need to get to that level as well. Um, we have to be servicing communities that are either unaffiliated or feel unwanted. We also have to stop picking winners at a young age and discouraging them from continuing on in the process. Why am I different? Um, there will be a natural inertia to create two categories uh, in this election, and I think it unfairly tries to explain the demographic of, of the field. It's going to be business guys, and it's going to be soccer guys, right? And, and we, we obviously know that that's not fair, but why I'm different is I'm much more a business guy than, than most of the soccer or business guys are soccer guys. I am uh, on the ownership board of Real Mallorca, as I said before. I'm already trying to take a great club and get them back into La Liga and spending time looking at our season ticket revenue, our sponsorship, our youth project, where do we hire, how do we, how do we allocate funds, do we focus on youth level when we know right now we've got to try to climb up to the Sukun division and, and, and plan for a future. So I, I'm doing that with the board right now. Um, I, I'm also different because um, you know, I, I have my dream job and, and I'm not taking this job to get profile or to get power or, or, or be on the platform holding a trophy. Um, I have five more years of an amazing opportunity to work at NBC with a team I love, and I was thankful that they've supported my wishes and my desire to come after this, that they publicly said so, um, and also that my wife uh, finally realized I'm not insane to, to go and do this with, uh, with how great things are in that space. But I just love this game so much, as all, all of you do, and I believe in something greater. I, I think we have a lot of the foundation here to create a special soccer nation, and we're getting in our way. Um, so, so I think I'm different that I'm already acting like a president. I, I already have turned this into a full-time job. And uh, one way I'm, I'm also acting as president is I'm having a summit, and Steve, this is in no competition with your 60 days after election strategy, uh, but before Steve and I got a chance to talk, and I, I appreciated when he connected with me and we got a chance to exchange ideas, and I, I commend Steve for being the first one in this race. I'm having a summit in New York City on the 4th and 5th. 
and I'm flying people from all over the country that represent the type of board that we need to make soccer decisions from, from amateur to youth to, um, to the, the women's game and the collegiate side, trying to build the professional side, media. I'm having that summit, out of it's going to come a progress plan that's going to illustrate how I hope to solve these problems. So we stop talking about what the problems are and start talking about solutions. Um, business experience, obviously I talked about my ORCA. But I worked in finance, uh, I had a career-ending injury in 2008 and fell out of love with the game because all I ever wanted to do was be a player and play in a World Cup and be a professional and that dream was taken away. And through conversations with amateur uh, um, people, the, the New York Metro League that I one day needed a guy and I jumped in, I figured out I'm a soccer player for life and this game never goes away. And, and that gave me the love to get back involved. On the media side, I've worked for every major network, and Eric pointed out that's the major revenue stream we haven't been able to switch on, so I have strategic partnerships there. Um, uh, my dad, and this goes in the nomination and, and how I'll serve, my, my dad worked for IBM for 40 years, and he said of the greatest CEO he ever worked for was a gentleman that hired smarter people than him around him to make decisions. I, I'm the person that's going to lead the way we've always needed a president to lead. I'm going to make it a full-time job to grow this game and make sure we empower the people that are doing that on a daily basis that aren't involved in the decision process right now. Um, the nominations. I, uh, I, I have two nominations that have been offered uh, to me, and it was the only two people that I've asked for them. And that also demonstrates how I'm going to go about this. I'm not calling around asking people for nominations before I ask them what they need and what they want. So I've been spending hours on the phone with delegates and some associations choose to nominate without speaking to, to delegates and not or, uh, candidates and finding out who they are. I commend you guys for rescinding yours and at least hearing everyone's conversation and what they aim to do. Um, but, but how I'm going to serve is by finally <coughs> showing the humility up, that I, I'm the person that wants to make this a full-time job, but not because it serves me, because it serves you guys. Thank you very much. <coughs> Michael? So thanks again, everybody. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's been an honor being here, and this is a, a great forum to, to further the dialogue. I got involved in this because I want to make soccer better in the U.S. We've made great strides over the last several decades, but we've lagged behind in some areas that is becoming increasingly fractured. And I think I have a unique set of skills that can do it. I look at what needs to get done in U.S. soccer. I look at what I've done over the course of my career on the soccer and business side, and I think I have the, the unique set of skills to do this. And on the soccer side, I understand things from all perspectives. I've played, you know, look, if this, if this race is about who the best player is, it's, you know, it wasn't me. I was pretty good. I made it to play, play pro for a few years. But there are other better players in this. But I've played youth. I've played collegiate for four years, Division I. I've played professionally. I've coached youth. I've coached collegiately. I've managed youth been on a board for quite some time now, and I've managed professionally. When you talk about um, the legal side, in terms of leadership and running organizations, you know, I was one of two people that started up a pro team in the A-League from scratch. Everything. from Like I said, from the name, I handled things from the name, and establishing youth development and the grassroots, to identifying and signing a player, to identifying and signing a coach, to drafting a club policies to, you know, soup to nuts, everything. I handled half of that. My friend went off to San Jose, and I picked up the slack. Um, in my legal career for 17 or 18 years now, I've been at the absolute best firms in the world. We represent the biggest companies. You know, it is, it is what this job is going to take. It's going to take intelligence. It's going to take fairness. It's going to take open-mindedness. And like I said before, it's going to take hard work. Preparedness, diligence, Right? Perseverance, these are things that I've been doing for 17 years. It's going to take the ability to bring parties together and in real time synthesize facts, come up with solutions, and articulate a persuasive path, articulate persuasively a path forward that everybody's going to take ownership of. I've been doing that at the absolute highest levels in the biggest <coughs> companies. I've been in boardrooms with CEOs at the biggest companies. I've been in, in negotiating rooms, leading a negotiation where people thought hope was lost, where I had a Korean, large Korean company on one side with an Israeli conglomerate and a Croatian conglomerate on the other side and managed to walk out of that room with a deal, which nobody thought would, people weren't even willing to fly to New York because they didn't think it was possible. From that level, I've done it at the, at the community level, like I said earlier. I was appointed by our council in my town to break a deadlock that had been going on for years. You can imagine what it was like 
when neighbors heard that they were going to tear down trees that was the buffer between their homes and Route 17 to put in an athletic field in a park. It's now <coughs> going to get done because it is a matter of governance and bringing people together, and it is a skill. It's easy to talk about, but you actually have to have the skill. There's no magic talisman. You have to actually be able to get it done. Um, in terms of losing kids, look, you don't want to lose kids at 13, and as I think one of you mentioned earlier, you don't want to lose people at the adult level. You want people to stay committed to clubs, loyalty to the game, a love for the game throughout their careers so that they continue to give back. I, like Carl, you know, look, this is not about me. I, I you know, have a very good job that I am very pleased with, that pays very well. I want to make U.S. soccer better. And that feeds into something else, Kevin, that you said. If I don't win this election, I hope I do. If I don't win this election, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to get involved at the U.S. soccer, at the, at the, uh, US soccer level and do what I can to make this game better. I've lived it my entire life. And, as, and I think, you know, I don't know if it will come across in the audio. I think it will. I think what every single candidate here shares in common is a love and passion for this game and an unwavering desire to make it better. Um, and I hope I have the opportunity to do that. Eric? Good job. It's always fun going last. I'm looking at your faces here. <laughs> Good faith. I'll go quick. Uh, as far as the, the retention of players, I think it's consistent with why we're here. Uh, it's uh, maybe a cultural issue that needs to be addressed that we can start doing the business of soccer a little bit better, if that's what we're going to call it. And that comes from an understanding of what is necessary to create those environments to make our, our players better. I mean, if that is something that we, we worry about, the kids get to 13 or whatever, but look, if you are able to create the environments that allow kids to, in, to, to not fall out of love with this game, <coughs> make them fall in love with it again. You know, I mean, it goes all the way to the adult level, but uh, it's clearly uh, a huge part of this. Um, as far as the nominations go, yeah, we, we, we clearly have enough. Uh, we were able to achieve that weeks ago. Um, I didn't feel it would have been appropriate to announce uh, my candidacy until I uh, had it. I announced my intention to run, uh, but we've been able to achieve that, which is uh, something I'm very proud of. As far as the, the leadership, uh, I've been the captain of every team I've ever been on. I've run, you know, you said maybe it's business or soccer. Well, how about running the soccer business? I think I'm the only one in this room that can say that. And that's probably what we need right now. We have a soccer problem that we are not addressing the business appropriately. They do mesh. They're not two separate things. The business of soccer is something that we need to accomplish now. And very few of us uh, have that ability. Look, you, I, I took over a team in Atlanta that was 429 and 10, and that's where leadership roles are necessary. You need to fix things. They say, yeah, of course we want to bring people together, and we want to because it's so fragmented right now. Everyone's complaining about what, what's going wrong. We're not focusing on what's going right. That's how you bring people together. You stop talking about all the problems we're having, and you start figuring out what are we good at, how do we get great at it. That's what leadership is. That's what's necessary right now. Now, how am I different? I've been just a little similar to to the other. Uh, candidates, you you have to understand every facet of the business. Uh, being a director of coaching, understanding what it's like to deal with parents, understanding what it's like to organize a team, organize coaches, organize a tournament. The real problems that our people that are in this sport right now have. You have to have a full understanding of that. I coached the U17s. I coached Kyle, actually, with... with uh, <laughs> With Bruce, no bad story. Yeah, it was it was, it was a good week for you. <laughs> but yeah, I coached with Bob. I coached with, I coached the national team, the U twenty threes, the U twenties. I have every uh, bit of experience when it comes to what are we looking for, not just in our players, but in our coaches. My what makes me different is I'm I'm a team builder. I'm very good at recognizing what's wrong, how do you fix it, who do you fix it with. Is that not the problem that we're facing right now? Now, what if I don't win this thing? I'll continue to change lives at a very lower or a number. But if I do get the job, I'll change everything. That's the difference. You get the opportunity to change everybody's soccer world. That's not something that I'm going to pass up. And I think I can do it. So hopefully you believe that too. Thank you. <coughs> Eric, thanks very much.
um, to all the candidates on behalf of our board. And if, I don't know if any of our board members want to say anything in summation or Mike. Or, uh, on behalf of our board, we really appreciate We know we didn't give you a lot of notice on this event, um, and we really appreciate you um, making the effort. Uh, and Steve, we appreciate you uh, getting on the phone. We understand the challenges you, you had getting here physically, and then, uh, you know, we understand that. It's not a problem. Um, I thought, it. Sorry? Oh. Um, I, I thought, said I appreciate that. Okay. I, you know, the, I think the answers were thoughtful and, and candid and honest, and we have a lot to think about and a lot to talk about. So thank you all very much. Thanks for putting the time in on this. You know, the Federation deserves this kind of uh, vigor and this kind of passion from its leadership. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for your time.